anyway, right. Uh, like I say, this is the mock-up version, not the actual book, but I've got this to refer to. So um, this gives you some idea of how big it is. It's quite large. The one thing this uh, manuscript doesn't have is the colour photos in the middle, which I'll show you later um, on the screen. I'll share the screen and um, you can have a look at the photo section because there'll be a glossy photo section in the middle. Um, this is obviously being a manuscript. This is just spiral bound paperback. The actual thing will be a, a hardback and uh, hopefully uh, quite nice looking. Um, quite posh because uh, it's gonna gonna be in a sort of chocolate brown hardback cover. Um, I have been posted a copy. It's not arrived yet. Uh, the gods of post have decided to delay it a little bit. Anyway, whatever. Right. I just keep repeating myself because people keep arriving. So I'm just going to crack on. I think um, I've talked about the link for pre-ordering and the discount copy. I'll keep mentioning that every half hour or so. Um, I think I should start with maybe i've already had a cup of chocolate but i was going to start by suggesting that anyone who's joining uh if you feel like it have a cup of hot chocolate so um i've had a cup here i'm going to have a cup later on and show you how i make my hot chocolate as you can see that is um well drank um but just make yourself a cup of cocoa or whatever there is a recipe this is totally nothing to do with my book but i thought i'd just share it because it's awesome um i'll pop it on the screen it's um, Jack Monroe, uh, her peanut butter hot chocolate recipe, um, which is fantastic. I'll pop it up. Um, so it's cookingonabootstrap.com, peanut butter hot chocolate. Um, and it's really simple. You can do this in the microwave or on the stovetop. And uh, water, dark chocolate, peanut butter and milk or almond milk. Uh, that's all you need. And you just melt the peanut butter and the um, dark chocolate together and then add milk gradually and stir it in. And um, so it's really easy and really filthy, which is a great combination. So, yeah, uh, anyway, just going to suggest that you maybe make yourself a cup of hot chocolate. Chocolate and milk or almond milk in the house. That might be one to try. So it's on cookingonabootstrap.com, Jack Monroe. Uh, or uh, my favourite dark chocolate is the Willie's uh, Cacao because it's 100% um, dark. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just going to start with a little reading from it. And I thought I'd start somewhere at the back with the conclusion. Um, just to give you a sense of the, the division of the book. Um, there's three main sections. The first section, I put my little tin foil dividers in here. Like uh, so, three main sections. The first section is um, about Yafik. So it's not that thick. That's just the history. I didn't want to spend too long in the book on the history of chocolate because other books have done that. So this is the sort of ancient pre-Columbian history. The main section of the book is the medicinal uses and the pharmacology. That's kind of a lot of it. That's the main part, if you like. And this includes the recipe section, the formulary with all of the chocolate drinks in it. And the last section is, um, the third section is about history. And uh, it's a bit more than that. If I'm including all the end notes in it, it's about yay long. The, the last section rather isn't the history, it's the mythology of chocolate. And that includes the pre-Columbian mythology and the, um, the contemporary mythology as well. And then the back of it, pretty much a third of the book is appendices. So you can see that if I hold it up like this, you can see that that much is the main book and this section is the appendices. I wanted there to be a lot of appendices. So that includes a huge monograph on cacao that sort of starts there and ends somewhere here. So it's a massive monograph. That entire thing is uh, basically the product of 14 years research on theobroma, on cacao. And then lots of little mini monographs on all the plants that are used with it. And I'll show you those in a, a bit later in a bit more detail. Um, and then 
interviews with a few people, selected interviews. I, I think I chose five selected interviews in the end with just some interesting people I met in Mexico and Guatemala. Um, okay, so I was going to start with a, a little reading from the conclusion. I thought I'd start at the end just to be different. Um, so I, I, I start every every chapter with a couple of epigraphs, with a couple of quotes. So um, the quotes that I, I began with this one are um, Oscar Wilde, heart, and this is from A Woman of No Importance, heart to live by being wounded, pleasure may turn a heart to stone, riches may make it callous, but sorrow, sorrow cannot break it. And then the second one is a Cuban proverb that I really liked, which is Toma chocolate paga lo que debes, which means drink your chocolate and pay what you owe. Um, okay, every drug is a doorway. Where it leads depends not only on the drug, but on the disposition of the person receiving it, the context in which it is taken or administered, and the attitudes or intentions of those who control it. This book has told the story of the pre-modern development and use of theobroma cacao seeds as a drug and built a case from historical, pharmacological and mythological perspectives that they are entheogenic, a word which ethnopharmacologist Jonathan Ott defined as meaning realising the divine within, the term used by the ancient Greeks to determine states of poetic or prophetic inspiration, to describe the entheogenic state which can be induced by sacred plant drugs. That's from Jonathan Ott's Pharmacotheum in 1996, one of my favourite books. It may seem strange to class cacao alongside powerful mind-altering organisms such as psilocybin mushrooms, peyote or tropane alkaloid containing botanicals such as datura species, but cacaos, and I, I describe all of those plants in the book by the way if you don't have a clue what I'm on about, so uh, hi mom! <laughs> Uh, but cacao's historical uses in ritual and ceremony, the tree's mythic association with death and rebirth, and the pharmacology of the seeds all suggest that cacao is a subtle modifier of consciousness and perception. It's possibly more accurate to call cacao a proto-entheogen or an entheogen enabler, as the evidence presented in chapter 5 shows that it may act as a polydrug potentiator and an amplifier of intention. So in the middle bit of the book, the book, the bit about the pharmacology and the medicinal uses of cacao, I talk about the sort of conventional medicinal uses it may have, and also about the traditional the traditional use it has in Mesoamerica, where it came from, where it was used in ritual, I think primarily to amplify intention. And in the third part of the book, the bit about the mythology and the sort of magic of chocolate, if you like, I talk a lot more about that and about how it was used ceremonially um, before the conquest by Spain. Hi, Eva. Hello. Um, anyway, so a central hypothesis of this book is that cacao is a hedonic modifier, an antiphobic stress modulating agent which facilitates and stabilizes positive mood, positive changes in mood and perception. But as with any psychoactive substance, its widespread consumption may be expected to both reflect and affect the cultures which consume it, and not all those interactions need be for the good. As Dale Pendell wrote in his wonderful chapter on chocolate, this is a quote from his book, if we accept the world as a playground, sometimes a battlefield of poisons, by which he means psychoactive substances, history becomes a story of shamanic alliance and conflict a story of magic spells and their dissolution by new spells. We can say that all governments are in the business of enchantment to keep the sacrificial victims from rising up and overflow, overthrowing those who sacrifice and eat them. Class cannibalism isn't generally regarded as desirable, unless you're a Marxist who takes the slogan, eat the rich at face value, but it's possible that cacao may amplify the desire nature which in imbalanced persons or societies, those who have a lack of stable bonding in their individual or cultural background, I'll explain this more in a second, could aggravate habits of destructive consumption. On a personal level, this could just be an increased proclivity to gorge on chocolate flavored junk food. But on a societal level, they may be an association with affluenza, an obsession 
with material possessions. This expansionism may arguably be seen in ancient Mesoamerican societies and our own, although a case may be made that this is simply a sign of cultural dominance and success with which cacao has always been associated. The word spoil springs to mind. To the victor the spoils, you're spoiling us with these chocolates, a spoiled child. So it's like, anyway, that's the beginning of the conclusion. So that's bringing in a lot of themes I talk about through the book um, and a lot of hypotheses. The two main pharmacological hypotheses are that it's a hedonic modifier and that it's antiphobic. Hedonic modifier meaning it, it changes mood with intention and antiphobic can help to reduce fear. Uh, and all, that, um, all of that is discussed in the central part of the book. Um, but the, the rest of it, the, the stuff about affecting culture that's also talked about in the central part of the book, and I'll read some quotes um, later on. Uh, I'm glad people are turning up. Hi, Andrew. Sorry, missed you there. Hello. Hello. Um, all right. OK. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Because I'm basically thinking I'm going to do some show and tell of like chocolate implements. <laughs> you, most of you guys, I think, would know what uh, what I'm what what it is. Uh, I'm going to show you, but. Um, I'm going to start displaying a few wares, but I, if you've got any questions or comments, just um, pop them up there. Um, oh, hello, more people are joining. Brilliant. Uh, I'm missing all these people who are joining. <laughs> Thanks, Shota. That's very kind. Um, hi, Eva. Hello. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Nusa. Brilliant. Um, great. I think probably Nusa, uh, lots of people are having similar technical issues. I know I did. I was... Um, uh, tearing my remaining hair out yesterday trying to make this work. So uh, for us who, us people who are perhaps not so technologically adept, which is probably most of the people who know me, so whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions at any point or any comments, then just um, put them in there and hopefully I'll notice them. Amanda, brilliant. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi Rod. Thank you. Good. Glad you're joining us. Right. OK, so I guess I'll just do a bit of show and tell then. Um, like I said at the beginning, for anyone who's joined later, this is not what the book looks like. This is just my manuscript version, spiral bound manuscript that I have done for today. Uh, my printed copy due to the current uh, shenanigans is delayed. Uh, it's it's on my it was supposed to be here by today, but obviously not. Um, it does look a bit more sexy than this, frankly, the real thing. It's a beautiful hardback. Um, and you'll see above the comments section, um, there's a 20% discount code for anyone uh, wanting to buy a copy that will be valid until the end of um, April, 30th of April. So if you go to the publisher's website, which I've put the link there, you can order a copy now and get 20% off. And the full price of it is 75 quid because it's massive and it's going to be very glossy and lovely with some nice pictures, which I'll show in a bit. Anyway, right, uh, show and tell stuff. So some of you, sorry sorry to Lynn and other people who know me really well, this, you're just going to be like, oh, I've seen all this, but anyway. Um, Molineo, the, this, it, yeah, it's a twig, it's a branch, correct, but it's... Um, it has a very specific use. This is used as a chocolate whisk, like so, for whisking large amounts of chocolate. And this, in fact, is the one I use in the cacao ceremonies because it's very, very effective for raising a head of foam, which was um, a really important feature of traditional chocolate drinks. Um, not only because it's it's pleasure makes it more pleasurable and aesthetic. Um, hi Sue, hi Chloe, and. Liza, cool. All right. Hello, folks. Um, it, not only because uh, the foam makes the drinks more aesthetic, but also makes them more pleasant to, 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 to take. And it was just a huge feature, but also because um, in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, the foam was thought to contain a kind of life in the same way that fermented things produce the foam like beer. Um, that, that is literally a sign of life in the drink. When foam was whipped into something, they believed that you were sort of whipping life into it. Pretty much every pre-modern culture had a concept of sort of like life energy, like the Chinese called it chi, um, the Polynesians called it mana, 
um, in medieval Europe uh, and the ancient Greeks. I think we called it pneuma or breath. And likewise, the uh, Mesoamericans uh, also had a similar concept. The Maya called it chulel, which meant something like cloud or air. And the Zapotecs, this makes me laugh, which you shouldn't have, just pure oil. The Zapotecs called it pee, um, but that also meant breath or wind. And it's really interesting when you look across the globe, even at cultures that have been separated by continents and had, so for example, the although the uh, Mesoamericans in Central America, and by the way, the term I'm using Mesoamerican means uh, the group of peoples who inhabited Central America before the Spanish conquest in 1525 or whatever. The Mesoamericans, obviously they had very ancient common ancestry with the peoples of Eurasia uh, before, but I mean, that's before the ice sheets melted, you know, at, you know, their ancestry was before the ice age ended. So um, it is feasible that they brought similar belief structures over, but it is, is remarkable that people all the world over had this common belief in a sort of life force, which was analogous to breath or wind. And that was one of the reasons why, hi Helen, hi Helen, and uh, hi Billy, brilliant, nice to nice to see you, um, sort of see you, not really, um, obviously, because online. Um, but the idea that there was this, you whipping foam into a drink was putting life into it. So foam was important for the uh, texture, flavor, uh, it, it makes it more exciting if you have this sort of big head of frothy bubbles and then uh, the, the warm liquid underneath or the cold liquid because chocolate used to be drunk cold uh, as well as hot. There are lots of different formulations in Mesa America, which brings me to my next topic, which is um, I'm going to repeat it. Just I'm going to keep repeating for people who've been here from the beginning. This is my manuscript of the book. The, the real book is not spiral bound like this. It's a beautiful hardback thing. My copy not here yet because of this nonsense going on. Uh, so I'm just showing you my manuscript version. Uh, the real copy is available to buy with a 20% discount code, which you can use now. Uh, it's the, the code is above. You can see in the comments above the comments. Um, anyway, right. Uh, yeah. So the, the formulary section of the book, the whole point of me writing this book really was to research the ancient history of chocolate and how it was um, where it came from and how the pre-Columbian people in Mesoamerica made it and what drinks they made and to be able to reconstruct as far as as accurately and as far as I could the drinks that they made to actually be able to remake them because a lot of them have been lost. Uh, some of the ingredients are still in use. Um, Oh, Billy, brilliant question. I'll answer that in a moment. Thank you. First question of the evening. Awesome. Um, I think I'm partly answering it now, but I'll, I'll have a proper look in a second. Um, anyway, so yeah, the, the reconstructing those drinks um, is was a major incentive for me writing this book. So in the eight, chapter eight is the formulary, which is the recipe section, basically. Um, which begins with just sort of um, recipes for contemporary Mesoamerican drinks. But I'm not talking about just ordinary hot chocolate or whatever. These are folk drinks. I've focused on the drinks made in Mexico and Guatemala and Central America, which are um, which use traditional ingredients, which have ancient roots. And then I sort of move backwards in time uh, and uh, uh, at the same time increase in I guess one might say expensiveness of ingredients, but it's really just the purity. So that the common way it's used now in Mexico is as part of atoles, which are thin gruels made with um, uh, corn, not corn flour, hi Sarah, hi, uh, but made with um, zia, corn, basically. Uh, so it's a, an atole is just like, a, I don't know whether we have an equivalent here. In the Middle Ages we did, like pottage or gruel, but they're, um, they're sort of just a drinkable breakfast, if you like, just made with ground corn and water as a sort of very thin porridge. And they add cacao to those to give them flavor. And, to, you know, there are um, thousands of different atole recipes in Central America, and some of them quite elaborate. And some of the more elaborate and expensive ones involve cacao. Um, but the in pre-Columbian times, uh, 
the elite, the rich, used to drink uh, pure cacao. And in, although on the, in coastal areas and in rainforested areas like the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, where, um, it, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll see if I can grab you a map. Let me see if I can find one. There we go. This is the typesetter's copy of the book. So there is a map in chapter one. But you can see it's a typesetter's copy because it's got all the numbers down the edges. Um, oh, so there's a map in this little chapter where I can show you where I'm talking about because otherwise it's all a bit abstract. Here we go. So let me zoom in a little bit. Oh, that's not how you zoom in. Sorry, I'm just showing up my technological ineptitude here. Here we go. So here's central Mexico. This is the Yucatan Peninsula, and the main cacao growing regions are these dark bits here. And those have been the main cacao growing regions in Central America for about uh, 3000 years more or more. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Thank you for joining. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so in these areas, which are mainly inhabited by the Maya, uh, which are really, the Maya were not one people, they were many, many, many different groups of people. Um, cacao was drunk by rich and poor alike through most of pre-Columbian history because it could be grown there, so people could grow it. But in central Mexico, which is very arid, cacao had to be brought by merchant caravan and in uh, pre-Columbian times they didn't have the wheel and they had no draft animals so that just meant people hauling it on their back for miles and miles often through dangerous enemy territory so it was very expensive it was primo good uh, so in Mexico City uh, which which it is was before the conquest was Tenochtitlan the capital city of the Aztecs who were called the Mexica, they called themselves the Mexica, which is why it's called Mexico City now. Uh, cocoa beans were used as money. Uh, they were literally used as money. So like six beans would buy you a turkey or something. Um, small change mainly, but nevertheless, if you were to drink chocolate, you would be literally drinking your money. So only the rich drank it. And it was specifically, it was by law uh, prohibited to the emperor his court, uh, warriors and knights, and uh, also merchants, because they had that incredibly dangerous job. Everybody else, uh, it was forbidden to. So yeah, it was um, expensive stuff. Uh, and I was gonna show you the recipe section or a few bits from it. Um, where are we going? Now this is, this is not how the book actually looks but this is just a page from the a couple of pages from the recipe section showing um a couple of recipes uh for a modern drink i'll make one of these later so and i'll maybe talk a bit more about that then um and i'll also make this one later and talk about that one in a bit so anyway right billy had a question so i just want to have a look why did you decide to write about chocolate in particular from your deep well of very valuable knowledge? Oh, if you believe it. <laughs> very kind. Um, why did I decide to write about chocolate in particular? Um, one, I am a uh, inveterate chocoholic, so there's that. Um, and two, I read a book in, I think, probably 1997, eight, um, a by uh, Jonathan Ott, an ethnopharmacologist. Um, that's somebody who studies the, uh, well, you know what it is, Billy, but other people might not. Um, it's it's the um, pharmacological properties of plants, basically, and, and their use in indigenous cultures. And his book uh, called Chocolate Addict, which is a very slim book, uh, but I loved it. And it talked about the use of cacao in, in ancient Mexico uh, and uh, how they used to consume it at feasts and have it with magic mushrooms as well as part of a divinatory thing um, and his book the really good book but his thesis was that the book was just that the cacao was just um, caffeine and theobromine that was its main active ingredients and everything else was pure suggestion and as somebody who really values chocolate for its effect on my mood I also like tea 
Um, I've also drunk a lot of Yerba Mate. I'm not a huge coffee fan. I don't mind it, but it has a very different effect on me from tea or coffee. So I'm just like, well, I'm not sure that that's right just because it's, it affects me differently. Is it suggestion? So uh, because I'm basically obsessive, that got me thinking about it. Uh, the third reason was kind of a, a pragmatic reason, I guess. I thought if I made a book called The Secret Life of Chocolate, people might want to buy it. And the fourth reason was um, I had a lot of ideas about um, pharmacology, in particular, plant, in particular plant pharmacology, and how the many, many, many different constituents in a plant contribute to its action. It can't be reduced in that way to just say caffeine and theobromine. It's while they may be very important constituents, it's actually the whole plant. And so it's a, it's kind of a Trojan horse built of chocolate, if you like. That sort of I wanted to create a book which, using chocolate as its central theme, introduced people to a lot of ideas um, about I don't want to say natural medicine, but about the natural pharmacopoeia, basically about how plants can work as medicine and about how reducing things to single parts, while it's a useful way of understanding their mechanisms, does not give you the whole picture and just how deep that rabbit hole can go with a single substance like chocolate. I mean, that, this book's taken me 14 years and that is essentially the tip of the iceberg on one plant, I think. Uh, so anyway, that those were my motivations, I think. Thank you for the question. That was a really good question. Um, is it? What's that? I've lost you. Sorry, Karina. <laughs> Sorry, Karina. Um, who else? Hey, Jay. Okay. Uh, who else has come up? Um, good. Nice to see more people joining in. That's great. Okay. Uh, so anyway, Molineo. This is a uh, chocolate whisk, and this was cut from the branch of an actual cacao tree by my guide when I went to Guatemala in 2011, uh, John Paul uh, JP, who's he's photographed in the book a couple of times. Uh, so it's used like that for whisking the drink. Um, and these are two post-conquest Molineos. Uh, as you can see, the Spanish influence, uh, they made them much prettier. These are the kind of Molineos that are sold to tourists. See, this one's had a lot of use. I've, I've even sort of bashed holes in it through, through using it so much. Uh, this one I just keep for decoration because it's pretty. These are uh, beautiful objects. They're turned on a lathe and uh, they're, uh, they're made with considerable skill because they've got these these entire rings uh, that are fully separate uh, but are made on a lathe. But actually, they are not that practical because these rings, while they're pretty and they show the skill of the artisan, cut the foam. They reduce the foam. So uh, they're more fit for tourists than for purpose. Uh, but they are beautiful and they do they do froth. But it's interesting that every single one of the women who make traditional chocolate drinks I spoke to and interviewed in Mexico and Guatemala today told me that no, 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 they wouldn't use these. They had their molinillos, their chocolate whisks made by artisans to order without the rings and without any with a solid head so without any gaps in the head like that uh, because that makes a better foam and in fact when i've done uh, a, a cacao, cacao ceremonies i did one uh, a few months ago um, this is way more effective for raising a head of foam on a large batch of drink than either of these so those are molinillos um, any other questions? Please do ask anything that comes up. Um, I can do a bit more reading, I guess, show and tell. Well, I um, what do people want, by the way, because we've got the three bits of the book. I've got a bit, I could read a bit from the history section, a bit from the uh, medicinal use bit, a bit from the pharmacology bit, um, recipes, or a bit of the mythology. Any choice, any, anything strike anyone there? First person to comment, I'll read a bit out of that section. <laughs> um, okay. Or I'll randomly pick something. Oh, and Karina, I, you said you, 
uh, you said you I lost you what bit did I, have I subsequently unlost you or are you still lost <laughs> my brain as you most of you probably all know is, is mostly made of tangents so if I do lose you then please just say and uh, maybe ask me to you can always type comment and ask me to clarify something and I'll stop and go back over it and clarify it and whatever um, and just to repeat for anyone who's joined later um, the book at the top of the comments there is um, a link to buy the book and uh, there's a 20% discount until the end of April for anyone who's watching this and the code is at the top here okay all right all right, I'm, I'm just gonna read, uh, what's that? Uh, I, uh, I'm just gonna read a bit then. Uh, okay, mythology, mythology. Thanks, Eva, Jenny. All right, mythology section it is. I was gonna read from the pharmacology, but that shows my inherent biases, not yours. So, okay, maybe I shall do one of the origin stories because there's some quite groovy origin stories in uh, chapter nine death by chocolate um see if i can find my favorite one okay I'll just start I'll just start with reading this section okay so this is um, just so stories origins this is a section in chapter 9 death by chocolate which is the first chapter in section 3 of the book part 3 which is uh, metaphysical chocolate okay page 1 of the pre-conquest Borgia codex produced by a vassal nation of the Aztec Empire under Mexica rule illustrates the Mesoamerican equivalent of the Big Bang, an explosion of stars and serpents pouring out of the top of a large turquoise bowl presided over by a black skeletonized being with clawed hands and feet. In fact, I might be able to, I'll find the photo of it afterwards. I'll, I'll read it first and then I'll show you. The serpents regurgitate beaked and taloned monkey-like homunculi representing anthropomorphized wind or movement. The star-studded snakes have been interpreted as outflows of power evoked by the Nahuatl couplet. Nahuatl is the language of the Mexica. All this, by the way, is explained in chapter one, so a lot of the terminology that you're hearing now has been explained earlier in the book. Uh, evoked by the Nahuatl couplet, Yohuali Ehecatl, night wind, Imputing, imputing unfathomable, transformative, and dynamic forces. Serpents on either side of the bowl face vomit up a bolus of obsidian on the left, and what could be a bonsai-like copal tree, Bursera jorulensis, on the right, representing two of the necessary products for sacrifice, copal resin for incense, and obsidian for knife blades. This ophidian eruption resembles a dark head of foam effervescing out of a skull-faced bowl from which one might consume a traditional cacao beverage. Are the origins of the universe depicted here as a bowl of frothy cacahuatl? Cacahuatl is what the Mexica called chocolate drink. I'll try and find you that picture because I think uh, it's, it's a groovy picture. I didn't replicate it in the book just because, um, well, it's uh, it's not a picture that I took. <laughs> um, so let's find Secret Life of Chocolate. Um, I don't know whether I will have this here or not. Oh, well, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to find it now, but... Um, Codex Borgia. No, I should have found it. Never mind. Anyway, I'll carry on reading. I'll carry on reading because otherwise I'm going to get sidetracked. Hi, Nikki. Um, Chloe, brilliant. I'll answer that. Thank you for the question. Um, 
Nikki wants some pharmacology. All right, we'll do that next. We'll do that next. <laughs> I'm with you, Nikki. That's my bag too. But you know, um, all of it's good. Obviously, I wrote it. <laughs> anyway, so bowl of fucking cacahuatl. So the idea here is that there's a this picture showing, uh, which you know, it's in replicated in lots of books. Um, it shows this skull with all these serpents coming out of it. It's supposed to show the creation of the universe and out the top of the skull is all this froth. And nobody's pointed out that this black froth is clearly a bowl of chocolate for multiple reasons, uh, which I describe later in this chapter. I go back to this. Mesoamerican creator deities included sky gods, such as the ineffable Mexica dual god Ometeotl, or the Mayan Itzamna. I've described both of those guys earlier. In Mexica mythology, the world of the fifth sun came into being when the diseased god Nanahuatzin bravely threw himself into a fire to become the sun. Some of the oldest identifiable gods in Mesoamerican religious art are the rain gods, such as the hook-nosed Mayan Chac or the goggle-eyed Tlaloc of Teotihuacan and the Mexica. It may seem odd to modern people that rain gods could be so high up a spiritual hierarchy, but rain is crucial for agriculture and therefore survival, especially in re regions which can be very arid. Meanwhile, the rulers of the underworld, such as the Mayan earth lords or lords of Shibalba, that's the Mayan underworld, were often malevolent, inimical to life in the human world and brought disease and affliction. They were objects of fear and derision and were given names associated with contagion, afflictions, or putrefaction, one Mayan death god was named Chizin, the flatulent one. These lords of Shibalba play a key role in the Quiche Maya creation myth, written in their famous mythological history, the Popol Vuh. The story begins with two divine twins called Hunhunapu and Vukumhunapu, sons of the divine midwife goddess of humankind, Shmukane, and her husband, Shpiakok. Shmukane and Shpiakok are the orig original Mayan day keepers, diviners and arbiters of social order. It was on their advice that the gods created the people of wood, which didn't work out so well. I described that earlier on. The people of wood were people of the third creation. We apparently live in the fourth creation now, when they created humans. The people of wood uh, were a bit rubbish and the gods destroyed them. Anyway, uh, which didn't work out so well, but provided the necessary precursor to the current creation. Their sons live on Earth and like to play the, the native Mesoamerican ball game. Their playing disturbed the lords of Shibalba, who resented all the noise coming through their ceiling. Uh, lost my place. So they requested that the twins come and pay them a visit. The twins went to the underworld, but the lords of Shibalba tricked them, put them through several tests because we're told Shibalba is packed with tests, heaps and piles of tests. Tests and uncanny impossible trickery. The ball in the ball court of Shibalba is a spherical knife surfaced with crushed bone, guaranteeing that the Lords of Death will win the game. The twins fail the tests and the Lords of Shibalba kill them. The twins' bodies are buried beneath the ball court, but Hunhunapu's severed head is placed in the fork of a tree by the main road in the Land of the Dead. Eventually, the underworld tree in which Hunhunapi's head was placed begins to bear fruits, from which gain a reputation for being sweet and tasty, so much so that Shquik, the name translates as Blood Moon, the daughter of one of the lords of Shibalba, comes to see what all the fuss is about. But one of the fruits in the tree is in fact the living head of Hunhunapu, in, inhabited by the spirits of both brothers. It spits in Quick's palm when she reaches up to pick it and impregnates her. Uh, mythological, um, what's the word, physiology isn't really accurate. Anyway, we get that. Uh, she is then forced to flee the underworld and finds her way to the twins' mother, Shmukane. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Shmukane doesn't trust the pregnant stranger from, her, from hell. All she knows is that her sons went to Shibalba and never came back. So Shmukane tests her. She asks Shquik to go into the garden and pick food for herself and her grandchildren, Hunhunapu's sons, one monkey and one artisan. But the garden only has one exhausted clump of corn in it. So Shquik beseeches the assistance of the goddess of corn and cacao 
who helps her fill her net with food and which she brings back to the house. Shmukane is then convinced that Shquick really is her daughter-in-law, so she takes her in. Shquick finally gives birth to a second generation of twins named Hunapu and Shpalank. When the second set of twins grow up and discover their father and uncle's ball game equipment, you can see the way this is going, they also manage to irritate the lords of Shibalba by playing a noisy ball game and are summoned to the court of Shibalba by the gods of death, where they too must undergo trials. Before they leave, the twins plant maize in Shmukane's house, telling her that if the maize dies, then they are dead too. During the trials in Shibalba, Hunapu the younger is decapitated, just as his father was, but the twins fake it till they make it by replacing his head with a squash. They have to play a ball game against the gods of death, who replace the ball with Hunapu's severed head as a comic wheeze. The twins retrieve it with the assistance of a rabbit, because all of this makes sense because it's mythology, which distracts the lords of Shibalba by imitating the ball by bouncing out of court, so that they have time to reattach Hunapu's real head while the death gods are off pitch chasing the rabbit ball. Having won the game, the twins realise that the gods of death are planning to burn them alive, so they voluntarily throw themselves into the fire, but before they do, they secretly instruct two diviners, Shulu and Pakan, to advise the lords of Shibalba to scatter their ashes in a river in the underworld. Meanwhile, the maize they planted on earth dies, and Shmukane mourns the death of her grandsons. The lords of Shibalba scatter their ashes in the river on the diviner's advice, and the twins are subsequently reborn in the river as two fish, so the corn in Shmukane's house begins to sprout again, and she rejoices. Having nearly at the end of this, it's a long excerpt, but getting to the point, having learned to defeat death, the reborn fish twins emerge from the water in the underworld and become human again presenting themselves as entertainers, showing off a miraculous trick of sacrificing and resurrecting the denizens of the underworld. The lords of Shibalba are amazed and delighted by this entertainment and order the twins to perform for them without realising their true identity. The gods of death willingly offer to participate and be reanimated, so the twins kill them but don't revive them before unmasking themselves and holding the lords of Shibalba to account. They visit their father's tree in Shibalba and attempt to reanimate him too, but can only do so partially, so they must leave him behind. Although in earlier Mayan legends, their father Hunhunapu is reborn as the maize god, emerging from the underworld through the back of a turtle. The hero twins finally exit the underworld as the sun and moon. The relevance of the rabbit's appearance as a stand-in for the severed head of one of the twins in the ball game becomes evident here, as the Maya saw a rabbit in the face of the moon. This creation myth embodies the Mesoamerican view of time as cyclical. The hero twins' underworld odyssey is a conditional triumph over death, disease and decay, and rebirth as a result of sacrifice. Challenges must be faced with ingenuity, and death must be bravely accepted so that life can go on. Natural cycles allow for a sort of reincarnation where wisdom, trials and gifts can all be passed on through the generations. The twins must leave their fathers and uncles' bodies in the underworld You can't and can't fully restore them, but can promise that you will be prayed to, you will be the first to have your day kept by those who will be born in the light, your name will not be lost. While the dead can't be brought back to life, their spirits can be honoured in the underworld. And then I've gone a bit, but the interesting thing which I, I dissect in the rest of this chapter is that whole myth is actually a, a an analogy uh, for the use of cacao or an allegorical description of the use of cacao because uh, cacao, the name cacao from which we get cacao is a Mayan word and it was written in Mayan as a glyph uh, in the shape of the, a fish with two dots meaning two fish Ka, ka, ka was the Mayan word for fish. So ka, ka, wa was a pun on two fish. So the twins at the end get reborn as two fish. The fruit, the tree in which fruits in the underworld is a cacao tree. Now in some of the myths it's described as a gourd tree, but um, that doesn't really make sense because gourd fruit is inedible. And the, the pulp of cacao is a very tasty, sweet pulp. Uh, anyway, there's lots more I could say about that. There's lots more that 
is said about in the book. Uh, so I kind of like pull that myth apart in lots of different directions and sort of look at it in terms of cacao and the wider meanings and also the astronomical links they made between uh, sort of myths, uh, their mythology, the astronomy and um, the and cacao. So anyway, that's just to give you a little taste of it. Hope that wasn't um, too long. Uh, I'm right, I'm going to go back to the comments and just have a look at them. Oh, my mouse has died. Oh dear. That's the problem. I need to get. OK, fair enough. Let me. That's a bit difficult because without a mouse, I can't navigate so easily. But let me just. Right. OK. So questions. Shota. Uh, hi, Shota. Does chocolate have a ritualistic use for the tribal people? Absolutely. I'll talk a bit about, more about that in a sec. Uh, pharmacology. I'll do in a bit, Nikki. Um, and I think. Somebody had a really good question up here earlier as well. Author's choice. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm being democratic today. I know it's not characteristic, but I'm, I'm going with it. Um, I'm sure somebody left a little question, which I can't navigate to because my mouse has died. And unfortunately, I don't have a I don't have a Oompa Loompas to bring me a, a new. Uh... Hi, Beata. Thanks for joining. Um, there was another question. I guess I'll, um, Chloe, that was it. Who was your biggest, thank you, Chloe. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, that, uh, did you keep coming back to one or two books or specific researchers? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> There's more than, the bibliography in this is, um, is quite extensive. Uh, so bibliography is yay. So it's quite long. Um, one or two, no, there are several books that in terms of the history and mythology sections, the, the, the first and third sections of the book, which are rather thinner than the central section, which is on the medicinal uses and the pharmacology and the recipes. Um, that's the biggest chunk of the book, if you like. Um, there were probably for the history section, yes, I would say the first section about the pre-Columbian history, particularly chapter one, there were a couple of books. Um, I can't remember. They're, they're listed in here. I mean, I wrote that section more than 10 years ago now, so it's going back a while. Uh, but you'll see in, in the bibliography, there are, there are sort of a, a, some, some books that I kept going back to for that. For the third section, um, not really, but there are a couple that were very influential. There was Dreis and, a book by Dreis and Greenhill called Chocolate Pathway to the Gods. That's a sort of real coffee table book. Hi, Mandy. Thanks for joining. It's a real coffee table book that I used as a reference. Uh, they were very good on the ritual and mythological uses of cacao, um, which I've just, uh, I think, well, I know, gone into a bit more specifically. So I've taken their incredible research and findings and, and um, just gone, I hope, a step further in tying a few threads together. I mean, um, the original research that I've done, the field research, is more into the, the composition of the drinks themselves and their medicinal uses. In terms of the mythology, all I've done is looked at the extant sort of research and what people have pulled together and then just tied a few threads together and added a few hypotheses of my own. So to get to your question, um, oh, another book, uh, Chloe, that I, I liked was uh, Chocolate in Mesoamerica. Uh, which is a comp I can't remember it's got a subtitle but it's an edited book by Cameron J McNeil um, which uh, is really good and uh, that's sort of lots of separate authors writing papers researchers writing papers that she's compiled um, so those two really Dreising Greenhill's uh, Chocolate Pathway to the Gods and Cameron McNeil's um, Chocolate in Mesoamerica both of those were very influential particularly for the third section of the book but I've kind of added and gone a bit beyond, I think, what 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 they've done uh, in my own slightly idiosyncratic way, I think. Um, hello to anyone who's joined uh, a bit later. Uh, just to say, this isn't the actual book. It's a spiral bound manuscript, uh, just because the actual book has been eaten by the Postal Service at the moment because of what's going on, I suspect. I'm supposed to have it in my hands right now, but it's not arrived. Um, so I'm just using my manuscript copy. The actual book is uh, a beautiful hardback um, with all the colour photos, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, anyway, uh, what else was I going to say? 
bit annoyed that my mouse has died. Hopefully I can reanimate it. Maybe if I take it out and give the battery a bit of a shake. There we go, that sometimes works. Um, have we got any more questions? Any more questions for anyone? Thank you, Chloe. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. Good question. Um, all right. Right. I think, I think I've just... Oh, there we go. Helps if you put the battery in the right way around. Good. All right. I've got a mouse. That's nice. Um, right. I'm going to do a little... Um, this is my another little show and tell. This is um, a poster. Well, actually, it's a display stand that I got for the physical launch, but it's not happening at the moment. This is from the... Um, I don't know if you can see it very well on the camera. I'll put a copy of it up on the screen in a minute. This this diagram is in chapter five of the book, which is called uh, Chocolate Love and Bondage Part One, um, which is really exploring uh, chocolate's historical reputation as an aphrodisiac, which, by the way, wasn't really a reputation that it had in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. It was a reputation that it acquired when it was brought back to Europe uh, in the sort of 1500s and sort of six, uh, particularly the 17th century. And it was used by the nobility and kind of every exotic drug was a flipping aphrodisiac then, you know, it was all these sort of exotic, extremely expensive nostrums. Um, but I wanted to really dig into that and see if there was any truth to it um, because of the pharmacology of cacao. So because, you know, it's been described as apocryphal, like it's it's not true. Uh, so I really I discussed the whole aphrodisiac thing. Is there is there is it even possible that there is such a thing? Because yes, there are substances, chemicals that can increase lust. I mean, you know, amphetamine can do that. Methamphetamine can do that. Obviously, it's highly destructive and not a great substance. But um, a true aphrodisiac is something that should increase love or, or or change the brain's chemistry to change the way that you relate to people. So something like uh, MDMA, for example, might be said to be an aphrodisiac in a sense. So I wanted to really dig into it and see if there was any truth to it. So this little poster is spitting on my screen. There. This little poster is based on the three categories of love defined by Dr. Helen Fisher of Rutgers University in, I think, 2005. So she does lust, infatuation and bonding, uh, which can be described as the... Uh, so the first, second and hopefully third stages of uh, attraction. Um, and what I've done with this diagram, and I'll bring it up on the screen so you can actually have a look at it. This is me fully geeking out. So uh, apologies to any of you who aren't into pharmacology and aren't into all this geeky stuff. Um, but I I live for this kind of stuff. So um, I'm just going to bung it on the screen. No worries, Eva. Um, thank you. Um, OK, let me... See if I can find it. Here we go. All right. Uh, I'm going to go full screen for this one. Um, so let me hide that. So hopefully you guys can all see that. And it's a very so that's the that's the poster. That's why I've just been holding up. Um, so you can see that there's lust, infatuation, and bonding. And what we've got here is. All all the substances that Helen Fisher in her research, uh, she's uh, a doctor at Rutgers University and she has done many, many years of research on this. Uh, all the chemicals and hormones uh, that go into um, influencing those states physiologically. And then what I've got around the edges in these little blue boxes, and I'll zoom in a bit um, so you can see better, is these little blue boxes are compounds found in cacao that directly influence all of these chemicals. Now, this is very hypothetical. The title of the diagram is a map of known neurohormonal influences on lust, fluctuation, and bonding, and the hypothetical influence of cacao's phytochemicals on these categories of love. Uh, so dotted lines mean inhibiting or blocking and solid lines mean stimulating. So, for example, if we look at the polyphenols in cacao, you can see that they stimulate nitric oxide, which in turn stimulates acutely or over the short term endorphin release and over the long term 
inhibits endorphin release. The polyphenols also inhibit this enzyme, monoamine oxidase, MAO, that's given in the key. Uh, you can see down here all the acronyms are shown, uh, which in turn inhibits noradrenaline and phenethylamine. So by inhibiting MAO, polyphenols will allow thylamine and noradrenaline to rise and will by stimulating nitric oxide over the short term the polyphenols will increase endorphin release and over the long term may reduce it so i talk about all of this in chapter five in some detail um anyway <laughs> thanks dan all right okay yeah <laughs> Nikki, that's a great idea. This is a, a living off chocolate in isolation. That's essentially a description of a lot of my life, but uh, I think it's a very good strategy. It, it's uh, one of the better ones. Um, in fact, I detail some research in the book that um, in, I think it's in chapter five, that same chapter, uh, where they've done epidemiological research showing that um, chocolate consumption uh, among particularly the eld elderly people who often tend to greater social isolation anyway um, is strongly positively correlated with better physical uh, and mental health and life expectancy so um, very interesting obviously correlation doesn't imply causation but when you put that together with the rest of the pharmacology uh, and the rest of the research that's been done in the book it's really interesting um, anyway so chapter five is is very speculative but uh, I've done my best to uh, tie things together and, and show all my working uh, in a way that means it sort of can't just be dismissed. It's like this stuff is worth looking into. Um, my ultimate hypothesis, as I say, is that cacao is a hedonic modifier. It does, it, it's not strong enough to make you high, but it's certainly strong enough to modify your mood and to make, um, I, I think from the, I show in the book, to, to uh, influence your mood in a positive direction and to make you more likely to experience positive emotions. But what it does over the long term, and maybe even to societies who consume it, is a very, very interesting thing, um, particularly in light of the fact that the Mesoamerican people um, regarded it as uh, a tree of the underworld, a tree of the land of the dead, and associated with the, it with the ancestors. And coming back to your question, Shota, about the uses in ritual, which I go into in the third part of the book. We don't know exactly how they used it, but we know that it was absolutely central to their, um, to every ritual that they had, uh, both sacred and uh, not profane, but secular. That's the word I'm looking for. So it was, it was used in their daily lives and it was used as part of every single ritual. And it was a very important sacrament. It was in fact used as a substitute for human blood and I describe why in chapter 8. Um, in Mesoamerican religions, in all the pre-Columbian Mesoamerican religions, sacrifice was performed as a kind of exchange of energy. So you'd give uh, some energy in the form of an offering or blood in order to get something back from the gods. It was, it was a purely an exchange mechanism in a way. Really, their whole religion, which was very theocratic, meaning that the, the structure of their states were built around the religion. Um, uh, the whole the whole religion was was uh, shamanic, meaning that um, the diff shamanism is all about immersing yourself in. So it was experiential. So people that the priests would want to meet the gods through fasting, through altered states, through sacrifice. It's direct, which is very different from non-shamanic, as I call them, non-immersive religions where, you know, people pray to gods, but you don't typically expect to have a direct conversation with them, as in you meet them, you see them, or they inhabit you in some way, which is what you're aiming to do in shamanic religions. So um, in their religions, everything was, that sacrifice was a key thing, and it was all about exchange. And bloodletting was really important in their religions because it's thought that the blood was housed the essence of the ancestors. Uh, and this life energy that I referred to earlier um, and certain substances. And so the idea was that you, in Mayan uh, terminology, the blood contained um, chulel, this life force, this essence of the ancestors that you would shed. And um, in exchange and, and, and that in, in the form of a liquid, it was referred to as its, 
which is kind of um, it's the, one of the better word is magic fluid. <laughs> and certain substances were thought to contain this it's. So blood was one, tree resin was another, rubber was another, and chocolate, cacao was another. And I think what's key and interesting about all that, and menstrual blood and semen as well, I think what's key about all of those substances is that they were uh, natural fluids, naturally occurring fluids that congealed. So they didn't stay in, in the same state. They were alive in some sense. They, they, they changed state. They solidified if left to their own devices, which is kind of analogous in magical thinking to what you'd want to do in a ritual. You'd want to gather something like a liquid and then make it real. So this, they would shed their blood with the essence of the ancestors and then they'd try and download this heavenly it's, which they would then uh, so they're swapping earthly its in the form of these fluids or or offerings. So they make offerings of rubber or resins like papal, which they would burn, uh, and 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 blood and chocolate, um, and uh, they would hopefully get in return um, this heavenly its. The the reason another reason I think cacao was um, so sacred it was because when you drink it of course it has this revitalizing power it, it reanimates you because of the, the the pharmacology of it and literally of course that i'll read a bit from the pharmacology chapter in a moment nikki so for, or for anyone else who who's interested in that sort of stuff um there's lots of research now suggests that it's got amazing benefits for the circulatory system for the heart uh, and for circulation particularly in terms of preventing uh, strokes and heart attacks and that kind of thing. So, yeah, so anyway, it literally physically is, is, is beneficial for, for life. Um, the synthetics I recount in chapter four of the book, where I talk about um, cacao's benefits for uh, life expectancy. Um, and they've done epidemiological studies on this. Now, epidemiological studies are sort of medium weak evidence. They're considered on the sort of hierarchy of evidence where in the evidence based clinical medicine, sort of scientific uh, evidence hierarchy, right at the top, you've got human double blind placebo controlled clinical trials. And at the bottom, you've got some sort of individual case histories sort of epidemiology somewhere in the middle. Epidemiology is where you look at huge numbers of people and see if you can discern any patterns. The issue with it, of course, is that while it's relevant, correlation doesn't mean causation. Just because something happens with something doesn't mean it causes it. But, you know, when you put that together with the pharmacology, with the historical use, then I kind of think if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. So anyway, in terms of cacao, we've got lots of really good, solid, uh, gold standard, double blind, placebo controlled clinical pharmacological evidence, uh, pharmacological and clinical evidence that it's really good for um, the circulatory system, particularly for reducing inflammation in vascular endothelium. That means the linings of blood vessels and reducing heart attack. and stress. So to bring it back to the traditional ritual pre-Columbian use, I find it very interesting that they used it as a substitute for blood and that they uh, were big on it containing a form of life essence and that um, one of the, uh, the Mashika name uh, for cacao, one of their allegorical names, because they often have these sort of allegorical poetical names, was, um, uh, oh, what was it? Um, Oh, the heart, the blood. It meant the heart, the blood. I can't remember the, the name in Nahuatl. Not that it matters, but it's, the, it's in the book. Uh, so it's, it's, they called it the heart, the blood. Literally, that was their poetic. Yololistli, that was it. So no, Yololistli was the life energy that they thought dwelt in the heart. And they called uh, cacao Yololistli, the heart, the blood. Uh, fascin anyway, fascinating to me, interesting to me. Anyway, um, Hi, Azita. Hi, more people joining, which is great. Uh, Terence McKenna's research on mushrooms. Can you draw some parallels with your cocoa yai effect? <laughs> I can have a go. Hi, Chantal. Thanks for joining. Um, brilliant. OK. Hi, Wendy. Thank you. Um, and by the way, any latecomers, um, the book, I just want to mention um, 
the link to the buy the book is at the top of the thing and there's a 20 percent discount code which is at the top of the comments section um which is valid until the 30th of april um i don't this is and as i've said and i'll keep repeating uh intermittently this is not the actual book this is just my manuscript uh which is spiral bound the actual book is a beautiful back but because of what's going on at the moment the postal service has eaten my copy for the launch so it's just as well I had a, a sort of manuscript bound in, in case that happened um, anyway uh, does anyone so yeah you were saying Chota you had a question uh, Terence McKenna mushrooms can you draw some parallels yes now good that you mentioned that because I do actually mention uh, the mushroom thing um, I wonder if I can find a section that would be in the pharmacology bit that would relate to that. So I think it would be in chapter five, chocolate love and bondage part one. And I call it that chocolate love and bondage because it's talking about the, is there any validity to cacao's traditional use, uh, traditional uh, labeling as an aphrodisiac in Renaissance Europe, but also uh, Helen Helen Fisher's research on the three types of love and the potential influence that the pharmacology of cacao has on various neurochemicals influencing it. As per this little post earlier, um, which I'll I'll show again later maybe. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's in. I, I called it that because bonding is the category of love. So chocolate love and bondage. And one of my hypotheses is that drinking cacao regularly may actually affect or influence the way that you relate to people, or possibly more accurately, people who are very drawn to cacao for pharmacological reasons because they find it really benefits their mood like me may fall into a certain subset of personality types uh, that are very drawn to it and there is some evidence for that uh, in some research they found that chocoholics have a very high level of neuroticism which means susceptibility to experiencing negative emotion and uh, I, years ago, when I did a big five personality trait analysis, which is, uh, you know, the openness, extrovert, extroversion, in, in, introversion, openness, conscientiousness, um, neuroticism, and the fifth one, ocean, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness. Yeah. Uh, when I did that, I found I had very high neuroticism. So surprise no one who knows me. Cause susceptibility to negative emotion um, so it's interesting that chocolate in in um, at least some research uh, people who are really chocolate also have high neuroticism those who are using it for self-medication I'm not talking about people who like it for gastronomic or flavor reasons or as an occasional pleasure I'm talking about people who really like need it or want it uh, in, in, in a sort of almost compulsive way so I'm going to try and find this section on mushrooms uh, because I think I think it's this chapter that I talk about it at the end it's, da, 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 da. that's last maybe sorry I'm just uh, trying to find it it's kind of scattered throughout this chapter Okay, <laughs> who worries? What else? Have we got? Hi, Julie. Thank. Hi, Lee. Hi, thanks for joining. My sister. Hello. Um, <laughs> all right. So I've got chocolate and depression, tasty caffeine. Um, oh, I know. It's not in that chapter. It's in the next chapter. My own book, and I can't remember where it is. It's a, here. We go. It's psychedelic chocolate. That's what we want. This is in chapter seven, associates and accomplices, which is a plants that were and are used with cacao in the tradition in Mesoamerica. 
psychedelic chocolate. Cacao was drunk at feasts and ceremonial occasions in Mesoamerica, much as we may drink champagne today to lighten mood, to celebrate and as a social lubricant. But it was also consumed in ritual contexts and as the obligatory accompaniment of any occasion whereby constraints needed to be loosened. This is a bit like the different ways that wine is used. One might consume alcohol socially as Dutch courage or to loosen up, but it takes on a difference in the Christian Eucharist where it becomes a sacrament. As we saw in the first part of the book, psilocybe mushrooms, psilocybe mushrooms are magic mushrooms, those which have a um, not a hallucinatory effect. They don't, hallucinations is a it's not an accurate term, but anyway, but those which have a, a psychotropic effect were consumed with cacahuatl. Cacahuatl was the Mexica or Aztec name for traditional chocolate drinks in Mexico before the Spanish conquest. Psilocybe mushrooms were consumed with cacahuatl at Mexica feasts, and there is evidence that psychedelic mushrooms and morning glory, as morning glory seeds, Turbina corimbosa and Ipomo violacea, um, I discussed those in earlier parts of the book. They contain LSA, lysergic acid amide, which is a precursor of LSD, uh, were important entheogenic plants throughout Mesoamerica. Certainly there was a link between cacao and magic mushroom use in Mesoamerica, but the question is why? Both are psychoactive, both have sacramental value, and both were ingested on important occasions. Is there any pharmacological significance to this association, or is it just a coincidence? Psilocybe mushrooms and the seeds of Ipomoea violacea or Turbina are classified as hallucinogens capable of inducing visionary states. But in addition to the phylogenetic differences between the fungi, that's the magic mushrooms and the plants, the magic mushrooms and the sacred seeds were used in different ways, described in two and three, and their effects are qualitatively distinguishable too. The psychoactivity of Ipomoea violacea and Turbina corimbosa, that's the seeds, is principally dependent on the indole alkaloid called lysergic acid amide or LSA, which is structurally similar to the synthetic alkaloid lysergic acid dimethylamide, commonly known as LSD. LSA has the same effect as LSD, but it's much less potent and has a shorter duration of action than its synthetic cousin. The seeds of both morning glory varieties also contain a cocktail of other alkaloids and substances which together produce some nausea and sedation in addition to the psychedelic effects. Psilocybe species, on the other hand, owe their psychoactivity to the alkaloids psilocybin and psilocin, although they also contain other alkaloids such as baocystin and norbaocystin, which are barely being pharmacologically investigated. And then I, I geek out a bit more about the um, constituents. Um, and I probably need to read this, though, if you're going to understand. So I really apologies to anyone who's not into the farm a bit. We'll need read something else a bit. If anyone's got any questions they want me to answer, please put them in the comments section. Um, and if you want me to read a bit from another bit of the book, um, please say so. I'm reading a bit from the pharmacology section and answering a question, an earlier question now, halfway through. Um, but. If you've got any questions about the history, because there's a section of the book on the history, there's a section of the book on the different, the first section of the book contains a bit about history, particularly pre-Columbian history. That's the ancient history of chocolate. A bit about all the different drinks that were made out of chocolate and the way that cacao was processed into those drinks. And if you have any questions about that, I can uh, answer those questions or read a bit from that bit of the book. The middle section of the book is all about the pharmacology and the uh, ethno, ethno ethno medicine of it like the traditional uses of chocolate so that section i'm in now i'm reading a bit about its use with the mushrooms this is a little subsection about its use uh, in ceremony and ritual and what the pharmacological justifications or actions for that might be and it also contains the recipe section or the formulary chapter eight which reconstructs the ancient drinks and the last section of the book is the mythology and the metaphysics uh, the myth the traditional mythology and all the symbols chocolate and cacao in native mythology and also how that symbolism became incorporated into our mythology over here even to the sort of extent of valentine's day hearts and stuff like that there's some really interesting parallels anyway so if you want me to read a bit from any of those bits of the book or answer questions or you've got any questions please just ask them 
Right, to get back to this, mushrooms and, um, and chocolate. The dimethylamide bit of the mushroom alkaloid's chemical names can be abbreviated to DMT, which is one of the main active constituents in the now famous Amazonian psychedelic brews known as ayahuasca. DMT is a chemical naturally produced from serotonin in the central nervous system. I've talked about serotonin serotonin earlier in the book, so I'm assuming everyone knows what it is at this point. And presumably it's exactly is the reason that compounds such as psilocybin have activity in the human brain. They are similar enough to bind to some of the same receptors. DMT, the psilocybin alkaloids and LSA all belong to a class of compounds known as phenethylamines, named after phenethylamine because of their common structural elements. And I've talked a lot about phenethylamine in an earlier part of the book. It's one of the constituents of cacao. It's a trace minor constituent, but there are lots of other minor constituents in cacao that modify and affect the release and processing of phenethylamine in the brain. Uh, so that becomes very interesting. That's one of the key hypotheses of the geeky pharmacological section of the book. When chemically isolated and smoked, DMT characteristically propels the user into another dimension populated with entities apparently separate to oneself. That is a characteristic effect of it. People who use this substance describe that repeatedly and consistently. Under normal circumstances, DMT is rapidly broken down upon oral ingestion. In the presence of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, DMT is conserved and makes its way into the brain. Orally ingesting DMT containing plants with monoamine oxidase inhibitor containing plants does produce quite the same dramatic effect as smoking isolated DMT, but is still reputed to be one of the most intense psychedelic experiences. Although there are many different ayahuasca recipes, their common denominator is that they're made with plants containing DMT, such as the Rola species, mixed with other plants, such as the vine Banisteriopsis carpi, which contain powerful beta carboline alkaloids. I've mentioned these earlier in the book that function as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which can make DMT orally active. As noted in the last chapter, there are monoamine oxidase inhibitory compounds in cacao too obey lower in potency. These include the polyphenols, the brown stuff that's good for the heart and the arteries, and caffeine itself. It's a weak monoamine oxidase inhibitor, or quantity. So salsolinol, this trace compound in cacao, and tetrahydrobetacarbolines, trace compounds in cacao. Those are all monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And just as these compounds likely potentiate the phenethylamine in cacao and in the human brain, they may also interact with phenethylamines in other plants. In Amazonia, close botanical relatives of Theobroma cacao, specifically Theobroma subincarnum and Herania species, are used in ayahuasca brews and to make snuffs with DMT containing Verona species. Researchers have also noted another Central American plant with hallucinogenic properties, Salvia divinorum, may operate by activating kappa opioid and cannabinoid receptors in the brain, which suggest that cacao, with its trace levels of cannabinoids and cannabinoid modulating compounds, I've discussed all of that in the previous chapter, chapter five, may enhance its effects. Salvia divinorum is a relatively subtle psychedelic when the leaves are used in the traditional manner. While it's interesting to speculate that cacao may have been used with Ipomoea violacea, Turbina corimbosa, or Salvia divinorum, we know for certain that it was used alongside psilocybin mushroom species. And then I go on to talk a bit more about psilocybin and some of the interactions and blah, blah, blah. So in other words, cacao is a likely a, pot a, a gentle potentiator of psilocybin mushroom action. And the interesting thing about it is that it also increases blood flow to the human brain. As I talk about in chapter four, uh, there are CAT scans of humans. That's, you know, com look, you know what a CAT scan is. It's like a big freaking x-ray machine. Uh, there are scans, of, CAT scans of humans who've just ingested chocolate, dark chocolate. And it shows that within, I think it's half an hour of ingesting dark chocolate, the blood flow to the frontal lobes increases by 20%. So it actually not only in your brain, in other words, so it improves the blood flow to the skin 
through the arteries generally, through the circulatory system and to the brain. So not only would cacao potentiate the action of some of these substances like magic mushrooms, it would also increase their delivery to the brain. And that I think is a very practical reason why it was used with mushrooms um, in, the, in the tradition. Uh, hopefully that answers some of the questions. No worries, Shota. Hi, hi Mel, thank you for, thank you for joining. Uh, recipes. Uh, Okay, recipes, recipes. All right, uh, I'll I'll um I'll do some recipes, Jenny. I think that's what you're wanting. Um, losing sound. Uh, can I, can everybody hear me? Is the sound dropping off, or um, are we are we okay? I'm not able to get much this end. Oh no, sorry, Chantal. Can you all hear me? It's uh. I will do some recipes next, although I think this would be a good time, me anyway, to have a little chocolate break. Uh, as I suggested at the top of this, um, maybe make yourself a cup of cocoa to have with this. Um, some, Many of you will have seen this process before, so um, if so, apologies, but I'm going to make myself a bit of chocolate and I'll show you that now. So let me just change the camera angle. Okay, so I've got my little, this by the way, that's a gourd, uh, half a gourd fruit, which is what the Mexica and the people of Mesoamerica would traditionally have drunk chocolate from. Um, and they would have used a very similar rest to this one. This one's actually, I think, uh, uh, Tibetan, uh, but they, they actually made little donut shaped rests like these for the gourds for feasts. So this is um, a bit of an analog of what they would have used. So I've got some swing here. That's just uh, grated uh, panela, uh, uh, sugar, dried, evaporated sugar cane juice. Uh, the Mesa Americans didn't usually sweeten their chocolate drinks, um, but I like it a bit sweet, you know, because Western sugar addicted palate, it does taste nicer with a bit of sweet. So I'm just going to get out some of my own chocolate, have a little dose up and then carry on. So I'll just show you this. This isn't very beautifully patterned, but that's like that's some of the um, some of the cacao. This is just 100% cacao seed uh, grown in Mexico, uh, shelled, toasted, uh, not on an open sort of flame, not super high temperature, and then ground on a metate. I'll show you metate in a minute. Metate is a traditional grinding stone. Uh, so I'm just going to use. I'm going to use, this is plain cacao, it's just ground and set, so I just want 17 grams of that. You don't need the weighing scales, but I just like to be accurate, so. And to anyone who joined late, um, I think I've said this already, there is a discount code for the book at the top. Um, there's also uh, there's the uh, link to the author's website that I means the author's website that's me to the publisher's website where you can buy it and a discount code to get 20% off that will be active until the end of April so I've got uh, my scales are doing their usual thing I wanted 17 grams and they've changed so 16 let me just see if there's any more questions <laughs> Hi, hi, Dad. Thanks for joining. Okay. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Christina. Okay, so 99%. The dropouts, I think, occasional dropouts are probably inevitable uh, just because it's a live connection. So as long as, just let me know if, it, if the sound drops out fully. Um, Karen, uh, I'll, I'll have a break uh, when it ends at <laughs> 9 o'clock. I'm refueling now on chocolate. Um, by the way, if um, I shared at the beginning, uh, there's a little uh, chocolate recipe that I highly recommend uh, here, which is uh, from uh, Jack Monroe's thing. It's not from my book because it uses milk, which is the work of the devil, but it's, uh, in my view, because it's not a traditional American ingredient, but it's this peanut butter hot chocolate. Uh, it's uh, on cookingonabootstrap.com if you want to make yourself a cup of chocolate if you happen to have some peanut butter some dark chocolate 
some water and some milk or almond milk you could make yourself that um now it looks amazing so uh yeah you could make that if you don't have any of this fancy fancy schmancy uh chocolate like i've got here um all right so i want 17 grams of plain uh cacao um, and by the way if you wanted to make a traditional chocolate drink like this you can use willie's cacao which is um, available from Waitrose and online. I'm not fancy enough to regularly shop at Waitrose, but uh, they, they do sell it, I've heard. I once directed a homeless person who wanted to buy some of my chocolate to go into Waitrose and buy it. Uh, so I, I was kind of hoping that an army of homeless people would go into Waitrose and buy it. But anyway, um, <laughs> whatever. Uh, this stuff is is pretty decent because it's just pure cacao it's the nearest thing you can get to this which is homemade it's not quite the same because it's industrially roasted it's beautiful it's very good you just get it in blocks like this that you then just you get a grater and then grate and then just whisk into hot water and you add your own sweetening like maple syrup and your own spice like uh, chili or vanilla or whatever so i've got 17 grams of plain chocolate and then I've got just I just want three grams of this which is my this is a little you can see it's very different appearance it's sort of like this granular appearance almost uh, more more uh, not not as glossy so that's the plain and that's the um, this one is has lots and lots of spices in so I make them separately because this one I grind in a giant machine called a melangeur this one I do by hand so um, I do this all on the metate I'll show you a metate a grinding table in a minute uh, because if I was to do it in the machine the machine would take on the smell that because the, the melangeur has a granite grinding surface and it might slightly absorb some of the smells from the um from the spices which i don't want it to do because i just want it to be plain chocolatey so i do all this by hand separately and then just add some of the high least concentrate to the plain so that i get just the right amount of spice in each serving anyway uh, oh new comment hi jenny thanks for coming <laughs> it's jealous. Uh, like i say I've, I've told you chloe you can get the Willie's cacao is pretty damn good and you can get that um, online or from Waitrose and you can make your own uh, really good hot chocolate. But otherwise, like I said, that Jack Monroe recipe is, is worth a try if you like peanut butter. Um, oh, thanks, Julie. I'm definitely fancy enough to shop at Waitrose. Well, I guess <laughs> maybe I'm certainly enough of a food snob, but I think that's a different matter. Anyway. OK. Here we go. Just going to break this up, shove it in there. So this is pretty much exactly like it would have been made in uh, pre-Columbian times, with the exception that I'm going to be adding some sweetener. Um, some of the pre-Columbian recipes do include sweetening, but um, most of them don't. The sweetening that they'd have used would usually have been honey or something like that. So I'm just adding a bit of, um, that's, that's um, as I say, that's vanilla, that's unrefined sugar cane juice that's been evaporated. Okay, boiling water. And the spices that I've used in this, by the way, are all traditional Mesoamerican spices. So that's uh, vanilla, chili, allspice, and uh, magnolia flowers. That's the Mexican magnolia flower. That was a traditional chocolate spice. And um, one called Rosita de Cacao. That's what it's called in Spanish. The Mexica called it, what did they call it? It's also known as funeral tree. They called it... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's been. I'll need to have a look. I'll look at the monograph in the book in a minute. I'll show you it. Um, so, this is the important whisking the foam into it. 
which is to say traditionally this was extremely important to whisk life into the drink but it also produces a very nice head of foam so because I've added no foaming agents to this, no plants that magnify the head of foam, this will just have a small layer of foam, like a cappuccino, um, nothing super dramatic. Um, but many of the, the highest quality traditional drinks have this really huge, bodacious heads of foam that can only really be achieved by adding foaming agents, like plants that, that really enhance the foam production. And this will just have a very modest layer of foam on top. I've not done a brilliant job there because if I had, um, that would be completely covered with foam. You can see I've left a little bit, uh, uh, if you can see that, there's, some, there's a, a little bit without foam there. That should be completely covered with foam. Um, in Mexico, uh, in some parts of Mexico, there's, a, there's an atole there, a traditional drink made with maize and water which has cacao as part of the foam topper and when they're making the foam uh, it's, it's a job done traditionally only by women and if a woman fails to make the chocolate foam it's sort of a bit disgraceful and she's kicked out and they bring a pregnant woman in to, to froth it for her because the pregnant woman has more life force in her uh, but it's it's really down to the skill of the uh, cook and i've i've uh, 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 failed to to live up to my um my my uh, experience there but anyway whatever cheers little top up okay that's good so we now <laughs> hi mel thank you thanks for joining thanks um right okay so what was i gonna talk about now um were, were the other good thanks shoto good you can hear uh okay okay mostly good recipes yeah okay great oh and chantal's saying she can hear again that's good like i say because it's live they're probably as long as it's mostly all right i think we're okay if you again i've said this before if you miss something or if you're like what's he talking about because at the best of time, my brain is quite tangential, then just pop it in the comments. Um, or wait five minutes, because I try and come back to the, the main question. <laughs> um, but if, you, if you're if you lost, or if you have a question, or if you missed something because the sound dropped out, then please let me know, and, and I'll try and come back to it. Hi, Eddie. Thanks for coming. Brilliant. Um, like I said, I, I'll keep repeating this. So sorry it's been from the beginning. Um, I've got my little uh, mock-up manuscript copy here. This isn't what the book looks like. It's just to give you an idea of the size of it. This is just my manuscript that I have spiral bound for this. The actual book is this really beautiful hardback with some lovely colour photos, which I'm, next I'm just going to show you a recipe or two from the recipe section. And then um, I'll show you the photos in the photo section um, and talk a bit about the recipe, maybe what I've just made. Um, but yeah, the, the actual book itself is, is pretty gorgeous. I was supposed to have it today, but because of what's going on at the moment, the post office has eaten it. Uh, all my local post office branches are shut down. They're not supposed to be, but they are. I think the staff just threw a sticky uh, today because, you know, who can blame them? Um, but anyway, the, the book is, the real actual book is available uh, to buy now. And I've put the link at the top of the thingy and whatnot with a discount code that gets you 20% off. Because it's mahusive and it will be a hardback, glossy coffee table, whatnot, with some nice colour photos in the middle and loads of stuff in it. It's 75 quid with the 20% off that will come down to whatever it is, 62 or something like that. So anyway, it should be uh, a bit of a it's 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 a it's definitely a reference book. And hopefully um, it's got enough in it to keep you entertained for quite some time. But right. I'm going to drink my chocolate now, and then I'm going to look at the recipe. Hmm. Okay, and then, oh, I just, in terms of the actual physical book, because of what's the, the, the st I'm not going to even mention it, but the stuff that's going on at the moment, um, it's not going to be available um, in solid hardback form 
Uh, we've got had a couple of copies printed, but it's not going to be widely available for an, about three weeks. I spoke to the publisher today and he said about three weeks time they're estimating. But if you order it now, it is available for pre-order um, or ordering because it should be out now if this gubbins wasn't going on. So um, it's it's available for order. It'll be in physical. So if you order it now, it'll be sent to you as soon as um, as soon as it's printed because uh, uh, obviously the printers are on the go slow at the moment. Um, yeah, and then there will be an ebook version as well, which is going to be uh, somewhat cheaper. The full price of the hardback is 75%, which will be something like 62 or whatever with the 20% code. Um, the ebook will be cheaper, but obviously um, you're not, I mean, it depends if you want to just read the main book, then ebook, great. Um, if you want to um, refer to it, I'd recommend getting the hardback because that has, you know, whatever. I, I'm a physical book person, but um, and also uh, the publisher tells me if you get the hardback version, um, the ebook, um, you can get the ebook just on the publisher's website just for an extra two quid. But you don't have to pay for the ebook again separately because you pretty you've already bought it. So you just get a two quid distribution or tax thing that you have to pay and you get that ebook as well if you've already bought the hardback. Just anyway, so you know. All right. Um, recipes. Okay, two new comments. Where can I buy a gourd? I got that. Hi, Julie. Thanks for joining. Um, I, I, that's Julie too. Uh, Julie Bowles says, um, where can I buy gourd like your lovely one, please? Um, I actually, I don't know is the short answer to that. I bought that in a, a market in Oaxaca in Mexico where they're very very common um, over here I haven't seen any what you can buy the nearest analog is coconut shells I bought those for cacao ceremonies because I've only got about six of these uh, that are, they're in Mexico they're called jicara and you can buy they're very common but um, there might you might be able to buy some from sites like Mex Grocer but I, I don't think they're you can buy them from eBay from the States, uh, but there's a shipping delay. And at the moment, there's probably a bigger delay. Um, but you can buy them on like, probably eBay, I think is your best bet. Uh, so search for uh, Hikara, that's spelt J-I-C-A-R-A, -A, Hikara. Um, you, can, you can buy them there, I think, without having to go to Mexico, Oaxaca, which currently you can't. So you probably get them on eBay, I think. All right. We'll also have some time to work in this in the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Okay, so let's have a look at our recipes. Um, sure. Um, I'm going to have a look at pictures after recipes, but I've got a little bit of... That's the typesetter's copy. Do I want to find... Here we go, excerpts for the book launch. Um, here we go, that's the... The drink that I've just made is in the section I've called Royal Drinks Approximated in Chapter 8, which is the formulary bit. Um, and it's this basic cacao one here. I'll just magnify it so it's easier to read. Um, and by, this isn't how it's, by the way, what's on the screen is my initial uh, sort of Word document version just because I've got it on the computer. It's not the final uh, typewriter's version, which as you can see, looks, it, it, it looks a bit different. Uh, it's just that this one has all these numbers down the side. So anyway, so this recipe is my standard recipe for miso American chocolate. It lacks a botanical foaming agent or any added starch, that's from adding maize to it. So it produces a smaller layer of foam. Uh, although a more adept Miso American Senora can triple that amount. It's not based on any specific historical recipe, but it is made using only the easier to find indigenous Central American ingredients and traditional processes. And the spice blend is my own mishmash of native spices, so feel free to extemporize. So in this recipe, you need a clay comal. I described what that is earlier. It's basically a round dish that they use for toasting. There'll be one in the pictures that I'll show in a minute. Um, a metate y mano, that is a grinding table and stone, or just an electric mill or heavy duty food processor, mortar and pestle or a spice mill, earthenware vessels, one medium wide neck jug and a molinillo, that's a whisk, or you can use 
use a whisk and calabash bowls for serving. So, uh, buh, 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 buh. so oh no, I'm reading the wrong recipe. It's this one. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, we need cacao seeds. This is for making a huge quantity. Um, but then the spice blend, I've got vanilla, all spice berries, Rosita de Cacao. I remembered the Mexica name for it. It was Cacala Shot, Cacala, Cacalo Shotchal. That's Cacalo Sotchal. That's how you say it. Cacalo meaning cacao, Sotchal meaning flower, Cacalo Sotchal. Uh, dried magnolia petals and frangi or, fla or frangipani flowers, anato seeds and chili flakes. Obviously, you can just make this using cacao seeds, vanilla. You can omit a lot of those. So you could just use vanilla, allspice, um, and chili if that's all you've got and then sweetening and then the equipment here um, and then the instructions are I won't go through all the equipment I'll just read the instructions cut up the vanilla pods toast the allspice seeds then the magnolia petals if using then toast the rosita flowers you detach the stamens and roast the flower cones briefly for a minute or so on a hot canal then add the stamens and roast them for an initial 30 seconds although this is an exotic ingredient you can get the rosita flowers. The only ingredient here that you probably can't get online is the magnolia petals. But like I say, this is my own mishmash blend. So you don't, you can just omit things that you don't have and it'll produce an amazing chocolate anyway. You place all the spices in a large mortar and pestle and grind them to a powder, sift them into a separate bowl and keep re-grinding until the whole lot is reduced to a reddish brown, sweet and spicy, spicy smelling fine powder. You prepare the cacao in the standard way which I've described in detail earlier in the chapter. You toast, shell and grind it on a hot metate, that's a hot grinding stone. Then put the liquid in a bowl and stir in some spice Add about half to one teaspoon of spice blend for a cupful of cocoa liquor and stir it in well. So you stir the spices into the ground liquid chocolate and then you re-grind the liquid with the powdered spice in it to make it really, really, really well incorporated until a completely smooth homogenous liquid is formed. Now you drop this liquid onto sheets of greaseproof paper in the form of round puddles and leave them to cool. And those are the discs that you saw earlier. You wrap them individually in greaseproof paper, stack the wrap stacks in foil or seal in ziplock bags, store them in a tight odorless glass or plastic containers in the fridge until ready to use. Then to make it out, you do what I just showed you. You weigh them out um, and um, this is that this recipe, you're mixing the spices in with the chocolate. So it's all made in one thing. Uh, the only difference between what I've just made myself and what you're seeing here is that I made the spices separately from the plain cacao because I do large batches of plain cacao in the machine just to make life easier and then grind the spice by hand, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. Um, Anyway, where would you get the flowers from? Yes, okay, uh, I have seen them online. So if you search for, I'm gonna type it in the comments. Oop. Rosita de Cacao, or um, Latin name, Quora Ribea Unabris. They're really amazing flowers, actually. These flowers, um, keep their smell for ages. Um, they, I mean, like literally years and years and years. There's samples in the um, University of Mexico Botanical Museum when I went there, uh, or bot bot ar Botanical Archive rather, that have, you know, they're 40, 50 years old that still smell incredibly pungent. It's one of those plants that, and the, the smell is really distinctive. It's beautiful. It's kind of like a woody, vanilla-y, intensely floral, it's beautiful, it's, I mean, it's like most smells, you can't really describe it, it's nice, it's really nice. And it's it's the main principal botanical ingredient in an indigenous Mexican drink called Tejate, the recipe is in the book, of course, which is an atole, which is made with corn. Um, in fact, let's look at some pictures. Uh, and don't forget if you've got any comments or you want me to talk about something um, stick it in the, you know, just write it and I'll talk about it because, um, you know, hopefully interest everybody. Uh, right. Ooh. Okay. Good. Here we go. I'm going to change the viewing here. How do we do that? 
page display, two page view. Okay, so this is the um, pit section of the book. Uh, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, this is my own, the, the layout will be slightly different in the actual printed book because this is just the, as I submitted it to the publisher, they, I mean, it's still the same layout, but it'll just look slightly different, but they've improved and tweaked it a bit. Um, that's in his labels, that's a cacao pod on a living tree. That's how it grows. That's, um, those are the seeds just taken out of the pod with the sweet white mucilaginous pulp. That's a cacao flower to scale. Um, one of the unusual features of the tree is that the flowers and the fruits, obviously, therefore, grow directly from the trunk. They don't grow off branches. And um, when it was first brought to Europe and people were drawing, drawing trees, um, European illustrators would see these illustrations coming out of the New World showing the flowers and the fruits growing off the trunk and sort of autocorrect them onto the branches of the tree. So you can always tell from manuscripts from the 17th century whether or not the author has actually seen the tree or not, because the ones who haven't seen it kept showing the fruits growing off the branches. They don't. They grow off the, the trunk, which is really interesting. I talk about that in chapter two, about why that might be sort of biologically. It's thought that because it's pollinated by tiny midges, some of which are blood sucking and transmit diseases, other interesting thing, uh, a lot of them are, some of them are tiny flightless uh, uh, insects that need to sort of crawl up the trunk. Uh, so the trunk is sort of typically covered with this fine moss that acts as a sort of little bug super highway. So um, the flowers probably grow off the trunk to make it easier for pollinators to access them if they're crawling up from the forest floor because uh, a cacao is an understory tree it likes shade and moisture i say in chapter two it likes to grow in damp moist crevices because it does uh anyway right so uh this is this is a uh, cacao blanco seed i haven't really talked about that yet it's a relative it's made from um a, a tree that's related to cacao, Theobroma, it's Theobroma bicolor is the tree, but these seeds are produced in a really interesting way, which I describe in the second chapter of the book. They're sort of buried under in water-filled pits for six months and then allowed to ferment. Uh, Anato, um, which is one of the, uh, the, the seed pods of one of the ingredients used with, with uh, cacao, uh, that's another really important traditional spice. These are uh, seeds of uh, this plant, the Abroma bicolor, toasted for making another drink. That's the woman making the foam mixture for uh, chocolate atole, uh, where she's combining cacao with toasted rice and the ground white fermented, what they call cacao blanco, which are actually these seeds which have been fermented for six months in water-filled pits and in a very particular sort of process. Um, this guy is uh, Reginaldo Huesh, a herbalist I met in Guatemala. He's standing in front of Pipaparitum or Holy Leaf, which is a plant spice, is it one of the spice plants used for cacao. And this, this here is just a boiling pot of plain atole in, in a Mexican kitchen. And that's me looking quite a lot younger in 2008, doing a really bad job at grinding some corn on a Metate. That is a metate, a Mexican grinding stone, and that is a mano. It's shaped that way, so it slopes away from the user, and it's slightly concave, just so that um, things collect in the center. Um, okay, and these are just a uh, woman. This uh, this uh, is uh, Sen Senora Rosa Gregorio, who is a lady who made a traditional drink called popo, uh, holding up one of the foaming agents. This is actually a uh, the stem of the shoot of sarsaparilla uh, a native species of sarsaparilla that is used fresh it has to be fresh it can't be dried as a foaming agent and that's their cat um flowers of bureria which smells exactly like jasmine a traditional ingredient another foaming agent this fruit they call chupipe which is a species of milkweed vine or ganolibus and these are some other spices that's rosita de cacao dried flowers all spice Anato seeds, magnolia flowers, and um, mamey seeds. These are the seeds of the tropical fruit mamey sapote, which have a sort of almondy flavor. And that's an uh, immature cacao pod. 
That's tejate, this traditional drink that Rosita de Cacao flowers are used in uh, with this sort of uh, fatty scum floating on the top. It looks gross. It looks really unappetizing. It looks like um, uh, sort of dishwa dishwater, <laughs> but it's actually um, a uh, re it's gorgeous. It's really nice. So this, well, I really like it. It's really nutty, uh, sort of uh, nutty tasting, a bit sort of like Horlicks or Ovaltine or something. But the fat on top, that sort of scum of fat from the seeds, uh, mainly from the mamey seeds and also from these palm seeds that they use in it, and the fat sort of precipitates. And of course, the fat absorbs all the aromatics. So it dissolves on the tongue. It floats on top of the drink and you drink it and it dissolves on the tongue and it sort of releases all the aromas, which it's very subtle and, and very nice. Sort of like a layer of cream on top of this sort of nutty Horlicksy drink, which is very pleasant. Um, that is, I can't remember... I've got her name here somewhere, Senora Crispina Navarro Gomez. Uh, I met her in 2008. She was the head of the family uh, who showed me how tejate was made. And she's um, boiling some rice for making tejate, uh, cacao drying in the sun. Anyway, you get the idea. There's, that's chocolate atole when it's finished with the foam. That's me uh, very self-consciously looking like a loon, uh, whipping up some foam for chocolate atole. Uh, and those are the foaming tablets that you make for it. Um, cacao seeds uh, fermented on the left and unfermented on the right. Um, so really interesting. Uh, just sort of like the the, fer the fermentation has um, slightly reduced the purpleness. You can see that it's so purple. This is probably a Forestero bean. I talk about the different varieties of cacao bean in chapter two, and Forestero beans are from South America mainly, um, although they're grown in Central America now, and they have a higher polyphenol content and are darker purple, but they have a harsher taste. The, the, the variety that's native to Central America is Criollo, which is typically a paler, a paler sort of cross section and higher caffeine content and slightly lower polyphenol. And these are, that's some of the drinks that I make with it. That's what I'm drinking now. That's the basic cacao that I've just shown you the recipe for. That's one I call undead chocolate, uh, but I made at Lynn's house. I don't know if Lynn's still with us, but um, hi Lynn, if you are. Um, that's, uh, that's the undead chocolate with the foaming gubbins going on. And that's a breakfast chocolate that I drink normally two or three times a week. And that I make with the Willie's cacao usually because it's mixed with maize and water. And I'm not going to use my own highly labor intensive chocolate for making ordinary breakfast chocolate. But it's very nice. And that's my own little spice blend. And last but not least, um, this is a, a, a drawing of a cacao tree, uh, a mural, I should say, on the wall at Cacaxla, which is about, I think it's 11th, 11th century uh, post 11th century and it's from uh, Tula in central Mexico, the ruins of Tula, which is a, it's called post-classic because the classic Maya sort of era ended around 900 AD uh, and the post-classic civilizations, they, they lost a lot of sophistication in terms, they lost the ability to do the, the long count calendar, which the Maya had, which was a count of thousands and thousands of years, millennia basically, and they also lost uh, a lot of the hieroglyphs they didn't have writing which the classic civilization did um, but this is a drawing of a cacao tree um, they've got there and, but the interesting thing is I talk about this in the third section of the book this little bird on the top is uh, called Itzam Ye in the Maya myths and it's actually um, a representative of the constellation it represents a constellation I think it's <clears throat> I think it's the the, the Big Dipper. Um, so cacao is here represented as one of the cosmic trees that can stand in for the Milky Way because Itzam Ye falls from the tree. In the myth, the hero twins shoot him down from the top of the tree because he, he wants to be the sun in before the sun rises in the first creation and he, he gets um, airs above his station. So they shoot him down and he falls from the tree and he falls from the tree on the orders of this god called Hurricane. And the interesting thing is, in, uh, at the beginning of the hurricane season, uh, the uh, constellation, I think the Big Dipper, falls towards the horizon uh, uh, in, in sort of its 
in, in that part of the world just before the hurricane season starts. So the whole myth is, an, again, an astronomical allegory. And here cacao is illustrated as the sort of cosmic tree, which stands in for the Milky Way. Um, and this to the left is uh, a picture of the top of the foaming cacao showing some of the rainbowy reflections. And I talk about that in chapter eight as well, because rainbows in Mesoamerican myth were all about what were described as serpents and serpents were really important in their mythology uh and um you know essentially the, the the all the little serpents on top make sense of that picture i described a couple of hours ago or an hour ago whenever it was um about uh, where, where you've got this bowl of chocolate representing the birth of the universe with all these serpents streaming out of it um Anyway, I could go on. That's the observatory at, uh, um, these are both uh, pictures from Chichen Itza, which again is about a ninth century post-classic uh, archaeological site in Central America. That's a stairway showing a serpent, which I talk a lot about serpents and their imagery and their associations with cacao in myth and their associations with, um, well, their mythological associations, their link to cacao in mythology. Um, and this is the observatory which was used, uh, which was lined up with the position of Venus, which was um, astronomically linked to cacao through certain deities like Quetzalcoatl, the, the Mexica deity, um, and, and several others. It's all in the book anyway. <laughs> but this is the picture section. So just to give you an idea of what's in it. Um, I could go on, but I think I need to um, have a look at some questions. And uh, so do do you relate to chocolate or this research to your role as a GP? Well, I'm not a GP, I'm a herbalist, Shota, so, uh, but I know what you mean. Um, yes, I do use it. I have used it for clients who, um, there's a few specific instances. One was a chap in his 70s who had, uh, <laughs> personal, but he had erectile problems after um, prostate uh, surgery, and I used it as a base Basically, I got him to make a herbal tea with some other ingredients and then used used that water from the tea uh, in chocolate because of chocolate's ability to potentiate uh, circulation. And I said I was going to read some from the pharmacology chapter on the circulation, and I will do that in a moment. Um, a great way to start the day. Thanks, you. Hi, Geraldine. Thanks for joining in. Brilliant. Um, OK, so maybe I'll read a bit more. Again, uh, any more questions, comments, just thumb them in the comments section. We'll read them and try and get around to them. Okay, so pharmacology. I still haven't finished my chocolate. It's getting cold in the Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, chocolate doesn't. I wanted to read a bit about the effects of chocolate on circulation and the heart and stuff, so that will all be chapter four. Okay, so in chapter four, which is called Pharmaceutical Chocolate, is in the middle section of the book, the second part, which is, as I've said, dedicated to the medicinal uses, both in traditional medicine and uh, mainly to the pharmacology of chocolate. It's proven, scientifically demonstrated, both through pharmacology and through clinical trials uses. And also it goes on to speculate uh, on the basis of pharmacology and animal experiments and other stuff. Um, by the way, I'm not a, a fan of animal experiments, but I do say in the, in the little chapter at the start of the book that the data is there. So I sort of had a bit of an ethical debate about whether to use them. Because when I started writing the book, I wasn't a vegan 10 years ago, and now I am. So I thought, should I use all these animal experiments? And then I thought, well, yes, I should, because otherwise, you know, the, the research data is there. And in the same way, I've used research from human experiments in the 1950s, which would now be considered vastly unethical. So I think if the information is there, you can use it. Anyway, that's just an internal debate. Most of you will not share that quandary, but whatever. Uh, so uh, 
This is a section of chapter four, which is called pharmaceutical chocolate. And this section is called chocolate, the super drug. And number one is called chocolate hearts, sweet blood. The native Kuna of the San Blas Islands in Panama are accustomed to drinking five or more cups of traditional whole bean drinking chocolate every day. It's a lot of chocolate. Around 40 cups of real full potency cacao based drinks every week. Being made only from toasted cacao, water, banana, sugar and spices, these beverages are naturally flavanol rich. I've described what flavanols are a bit earlier. It's estimated that the average Kuna adult consumes about 900 milligrams of cacao polyphenols every day, equivalent to 22.5 to 75 grams or three, and a, three quarters to two and two thirds of an ounce of high quality cacao seed. That's a lot. That's like a lot. Anyway, this is approximately the same as 75 to 150 grams of dark chocolate per day. If you think about one of those large green and black spars is 100 grams. That's a lot of chocolate um, per day, but without the added fat and less highly processed. So undoubtedly containing more polyphenols and probably with a better flavour to activity ratio too. Again, by this point in the book, I've described what polyphenols are, what flavanols are, what all of these things are that I'm, I'm talking about. So the Kuna living in San Blas experienced very little age related high blood pressure, circulatory disease or type 2 diabetes. But when they moved to other regions and abandoned their traditional diet and the copious quantities of ultra high quality drinking chocolate that entails, these migrated Kuna acquire the same levels of diabetes and cardiovascular disease as any other average city dwelling Western diet consuming population. This observation is highly relevant because cardiovascular disease, including heart attack and stroke, is the main cause of death in the so-called developed world, killing an estimated 17 million people every year. Which makes it interesting that there is now a growing body of clinical research suggesting that cacao is a highly effective preventive remedy for these disorders. Dark chocolate slightly lowers blood pressure, not much, and beneficially affects cholesterol profiles, not that much, marginally raising HDL and lowering LDL and total cholesterol, indicating a small reduction in the risk of heart attack or stroke. Far more significant is the effect of cacao on the vascular endothelium, the inner lining of blood vessels, and on platelets, components of the blood that are central to the clotting process. The flavanols in cacao increase nitric oxide production in the vascular endothelium, dilating blood vessels and increasing blood flow throughout the body. The polyphenols also reduce platelet aggregation and clot formation and stimulate angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. Essentially, cacao appears to be a hemodynamic marvel, simultaneously reducing almost every risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It dilates narrow blood vessels, decreases the tendency to clot, reduces inflammation in the lining of blood vessels, lowers levels of blood lipids, which can accumulate on damaged artery walls, stabilizes damaged red blood cells, strengthens the heartbeat, reduces blood pressure, and increases the rate of blood vessel repair. See Appendix A for full details of the studies conducted on cacao and chocolate. Uh, Appendix A is the monograph on chocolate, that about 50 page monograph, but if you want to get really technical and geeky, it's all in the appendices. A meta-analysis is a type of study which rounds up all previous studies on the same subjects, filters out the ones that weren't done to a high enough standard or where the results may be inaccurate or biased, and works out what the sum total of the evidence so far is saying. It should be no surprise that a 2011 meta-analysis of cacao's usefulness for preventing cardiovascular disease concluded that people who eat the most chocolate were 37% less likely to have a heart attack and 29% less likely to have a stroke than people who ate little or no chocolate no matter what else they did. Smokers, the obese, people who didn't exercise, people who ate only fried food, they all had a similar reduction of relative risk if they ate more chocolate. Relative risk doesn't mean, by the way, just leaving the book aside for a moment, relative risk doesn't mean absolute risk. 
In other words, if you ate a bag of chips every day and no vegetables and did no exercise and smoked, what it means, relative risk reduction, means that the chocolate would reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke by whatever that was, 30 odd percent and 29 percent relative to if you didn't have the chocolate, not relative to somebody who ate loads of veg and did loads of exercise. What do you see what I mean? It reduces relative risk. It's not absolute risk, um, but still it's very impressive. It means that that is consistent um, across, you know, so it's not negated by bad behavior. Uh, where was I? So this extraordinary finding is derived from several large surveys in the US, a Boston study which used questionnaires and heart scans, uh, sent cardiac computerized demography, CCT scans, to assess 2,217 participants found an inverse association between frequency of chocolate consumption and coronary artery atherosclerosis with the lowest risk of arterial disease for those who consume chocolate two or more times per week. In a separate questionnaire only study with 4,970 participants from the same population, frequency of chocolate consumption was also found to reduce risk of coronary heart disease even more significantly. The greatest reduction occurred for those who consume chocolate five times or more each week, a 57% relative risk reduction compared to non-consumers. Eating chocolate one to four times a week reduced the risk by 26%, but those who consume chocolate only once, one to two, three times each month have the same risk as non-consumers. So you need to have chocolate once or twice a week, basically, to get some benefit. Interestingly, the latter study also showed that consuming non-chocolate candy five times or more each week was associated with a 49% higher risk of coronary heart disease. In other words, higher added dietary sugar was intake was clearly increased the risk of developing heart disease if the sugar was not mixed with cacao in the form of chocolate. This makes sense given the observation that carbohydrates increase the absorption of cacao's polyphenols. And as I go on to say in a later chapter, sugar itself is very damaging, which we kind of know, but I explain why. In both of the Boston studies, great care was taken to get a clear picture by adjusting for other factors which could have affected the results, such as smoking, alcohol intake, exercise, calorie intake, BMI, fruit and vegetable intake, age, sex, and education. Another study from Germany suggests that the protective effects of chocolate may be even stronger against stroke than heart and arterial disease. This eight-year population study with 19,357 participants showed that the people with the highest levels of chocolate consumption had a 49% relative risk reduction for heart attack and stroke put together with slightly stronger protective effects against stroke. Um, most interestingly, the group with the lowest risk the most avid consumers of chocolate also have the lowest vegetable intake. So the people who are proper, proper chocolate heads and ate less vegetables just because they were scarfing so much chocolate still had a massive risk of reduction in stroke. That doesn't mean that the best strategy is to eat only chocolate and avoid vegetables. <laughs> Not at all, because this is looking at only one measure, stroke. Uh, there'll be lots of other diseases and whatever those vegetables are useful for, but still very interesting. Uh, that that was that held true. A couple of new comments. Let's have a look. My mouse has died again. Um, we made some hot chocolate. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, it's, I, yeah, I don't know how to share photos, Chloe. It'd be good if you could. We added some chili. No, chili is totally authentic. Uh, I'll go on to the monographs in a second and show you. Chili is very, very authentic. It's one of the traditional ingredients um, associated with cacao. And 100%, I'm very, uh, very proud of you. That's sounds patronizing but that's perfect so great uh, where do you get magnolia from okay the uh you totally could use um the, the magnolia flowers they use um in mexico would be magnolia mexicana or magnolia de albata those species either um but you know you could just dry magnolia flowers here and use them i mean that they're, they're going to be a different species but as long as they've got some beautiful aroma that the point really was to get the the aromatics into the cacao and magnolia uh, most species have analogous medicinal effects mainly acting on the heart they're kind of um i know you're a herbalist like me either so it's like uh, a little bit like passion flower uh, sort of slightly sedative um good for nervous palpitations particularly sort of um 
an anxiety related palpitations um so that's the kind of thing chocolate breakfast julie brilliant um okay great all right so let's see i'm just going to try to reanimate my dead mouse again <laughs> i should have bought a battery but i you know halfway through i don't want to leave the room and whatnot okay oh no i think this one's door nailed now i think it's it's had as much as it can take oh well all right let's i'm just gonna have to do this with the touchpad which is a bit sketchy um what did i want to show you let's maybe go to the here we go Uh, let's get rid of that. This is this is how the book sort of actually looks in print without the numbers downside of the thing. As I say, this is the typesetter's copy. Ah, um, oh, it's really annoying not having a mouse because <laughs> uh, I can't control this very well. But whatever. Uh, okay, I want to go to this all chapter one. And this is a little, by the way, this is a little table at the end of chapter one. Let me do the two page view. Hang on. Uh, page display. Here we go. Can't really see it very clearly, but this is a, a chocolate timeline. Um, you can see it's, you, you have to turn your head, sorry, <laughs> but you can see that we're comparing the, the historical from 3000 BC. To the present day the 2000s uh so this century anyway for the history of chocolate the history of miso america and the wor world history just so you can see uh, the historical development i'm not going to linger on this i just thought i'd show you that's a thing in chapter one um da -da 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 -da, page display um single page I wanted to go to um what was i going to show you oh yeah that was it because you said is um chloe you said is is chili authentic and i said yes but i think it's this is the right chapter yeah chapter six is called associates and this is about all the plants that were used with cacao in the tradition and um it's uh it describes all of them goes through all of them so you can see here we're talking about things that and i, I go through all the, their medicinal uses in traditional medicine and just to them because this section of the book is all about pharmacology right and medicinal uses this is in the central section of the book uh and you can see here kn capsicum that's chili there uh but this section you it, it divides uh, into sort of all the different medicinal uses for pain relief the heart the sickle cell anemia potentially for mood regulation uh for even potentially for cancer this is obviously all potential and traditional use um but i talk about the pharmacology of it as in why that might actually how that might actually have some validity um and uh diarrhea there more brown liquid um uh, age extension very interesting potentials there and then foaming agents uh so that whole chapter is about all the plants that we use with it um the moment experiment with foaming agents and whatever and then psychedelic chocolate uh it's used with mushrooms where i read i read a bit an excerpt from that earlier um and then in the back of the book in the appendices we've got appendix b is all of the I think it's the next page here we go mini monographs so each of these is a little monograph in the appendices about all the flowers that were used with cow not all of them but just some of the main ones and you can see there's a monograph on KN, which is chili uh, as well as vanilla and all of these other guys all here uh, so the f ones which are familiar to us would be um, maybe for some of you, Anato, the red food colouring, 
um, cayenne, chili, obviously we all know chili, magnolia flowers are to some extent familiar, although this is the Mexican species, all spice we all know, um, and vanilla. Those are, they're all original. Everyone thinks of chili as coming from Asia because it's so central to Indian and Asian cuisine, but it originated from Mexico. You wouldn't think it, but until the 1525, until the 16th century, chili hadn't been heard of in India or, or it's kind of like, you know, potatoes and an and island, <laughs> you know, like potatoes come from South America. But, um, you know, some some and tomatoes and Italian cooking tomatoes are from Mesoamerica, too. Uh, they originated from from Central America and red peppers. But of course, everyone thinks of tomatoes as an uh, Italian cuisine, chilies and Indian and Asian cuisine. But um, actually, they all originate from Central America. So you've got these little mini just three page monographs in the appendices to detail all the technical stuff. About plants. Um, so. Uh, with some of my little drawings. By the way, all the photos and, and drawings in the book are all mine because I'm a control freak. So the whole book is my stuff. Um, and thank you very much to my publisher who, for his sins, uh, um, put up with a lot of my. I didn't have any tantrums, but you know, he put up with uh, <laughs> with me insisting on a lot. Um, all right, so this is the little monograph on chili and so showing sort of uh, how it, how and where it grows. Um, I don't because I'm not a botanist, I've tried to keep the botany terminology to a minimum and just talk about how it's grown rather than botanical terms, which is just a prejudice of my own. I've gone right into the, the chemistry of it and sort of ignored the botany a bit, um, which I know some people will be a bit disappointed by because they like the botany, but I like the, the medicinal stuff. So uh, traditional uses, what it was used for in the tradition, and then the over the page, the scientific data, I've divided it into in vitro, that means in the laboratory, in non-human animals and in humans. Uh, and then lastly, summary of actions. Uh, so this is if you wanted to use chili medicinally and indications for internal or topical use. Uh, and then cautions, certain people and the dosage and preparation. I've done that for all the herbs, in, and including in the big monograph of cacao. So all the spices that are used with it. So that's in the geeky appendix bit. I mean, the whole book's geeky, but that's some... Um, Super geeky, if you're into that. Anyway, um, new comments for... I sent a photo on WhatsApp. All right, let me have a look. All right. Um, thanks, Shota. Uh, you're feeling like a head right now. Good. <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, hang on. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? It's like, I don't think anyone else is has joined have they uh i was hoping more people would would join in i thought there'd be more but you know you never know do you it's um i'm very glad that you guys have all joined in thank you for thank you for coming it's brilliant oh 83 there's more people there's a lot of people who haven't commented um just uh say hello if you're if you're if you're here because um and if you've got as i said i keep saying if you've got a question if you've got a comment just bung it in the comments because this is interactive and I will um, interact and it gives me stuff to speak about because um, while I'm quite prepared to blether on, um, I'd also like to take some direction for anyone who's joined a bit later. Um, this is not the actual printed version of the book. This is a manuscript that I had spiral bound for it. The actual printed book isn't with me yet because of what's going on at the moment. The postal service has swallowed it. Um, the book will be in print for everyone in about three weeks. You can order it now. And at the top of this thread, above the comments, there's a discount code that gets you 20% off. So, and that will be active until the end of April. So that is a code specially for this launch. So any of you guys have come, thank you very much. If you wanna order a copy, um, order it for the end of April from the publisher's website and you get 20% off. Um, buh, buh, buh. What else was I gonna bang on about? Um, book yes ah yeah and i was going to talk about the, the the three sections of the book i've said this already so sorry to anyone who's been from the beginning first section is the history of, of of chocolate mainly focusing on the ancient history and the different forms of chocolate it's called bodies of chocolate and that's chapters one and two and it's about the athic the central section of the book the main book is much thicker and that's the medicinal history of chocolate and its pharmacological properties and all its different medicinal uses um so it's, it's traditional uses and also uh the uses sort of in 
pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. That means uh, Central America before the Spanish conquest in the time of the Aztecs and the Maya and all of that. Look, um, so how they used it and how it was incorporated into medicine then, how it still is today in contemporary folk medicine. Uh, that's chapter three mainly. And then how it's used in Renaissance Europe. Also, it talks about in chapter three. How it was incorporated into medicine there, which is really interesting uh, or will be to some of us. And then um, the, there's a, the chapter four is all about the pharmacology of it. Like it goes really into detail about um, that's the chapter called pharmaceutical chocolate about all the different how, how the bean can be divided up into compounds. So you can see here I've got like a little pie chart showing the composition of the bean. So you can see the bean is like that's the fat content. It's more than 50 percent. And then I, I, I and these the, the, all the different classes of compound in it and then I divide uh, all I go through each of those separate classes of compound in it for any of you pharma geeks so for example this is the fat content bit and I've div divided that into all the different types of fat in it and then I go through what they all do to you physically when you eat or drink or ingest chocolate so um, that section of the book is really about all the studies of all the different compounds in chocolate and then what chocolate has been shown to or more truly cacao because that's the seed from which chocolate is made uh the difference is cacao is the seed uh the roasted toasted seed you can get it raw as well and i go into the differences between raw and cooked in this chapter i think there's a little table in fact which shows the difference between raw and cooked it's sort of look, split onto two pages again this is not the actual book this is a spiral bound manuscript the real book is properly bound with a hard cover and everything this is just because um you know whatever but so we've got this is the a table showing the difference between um unfermented dried raw cacao raw fermented and dried and fermented dried and toasted um because there are each of those stages involves chemical transformation and different compounds involved because so there's a big thing that you know probably all of you for many years has been a thing about raw cacao uh, lots of people making claims that it's much better for you and i discuss that in the book my own position is um in some respects it might be but i'm going to go with the traditional methods of preparation which always involve toasting it not only because it produces a superior whatever you think, superior flavour, definitely. Um, but it also, um, and it produces new compounds. And some of those compounds, which are discussed in that chapter, um, cross the blood brain barrier, they get into the brain. And they're called some of this class of compounds called diketopiperazines. They're quite a major part of, of cacao's minor constituents, if you like, their, their, their presence is, is, um, they're not a huge part of cacao's uh, in terms of quantity but they're, they're they're noticeable and they're pharmacologically active and we don't know what a lot of them do we know that they get into the brain we know that they're only present in toasted chocolate and we know that from research on individual dkps diketopiperazines that they do um some of them do really remarkable things some of them have anti-cancer effects some of them protect specific cells from oxidative damage so uh yeah it's 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 really simplistic to say like some of the raw uh people say who follow this sort of raw food ideology um that you know say that you should eat everything raw and you should never cook anything which apart from being wildly impractical is uh not is contradicts every traditional medicine history uh, system in the history of the world um but whatever i'm you know each to their own if you're a raw food person fine grab you know get on with it it's good you'll have be having lots of vitamin c and whatever but um yeah the, the the they say that because raw chocolate has higher polyphenols and these are the antioxidants in chocolate then it's definitely better for you that's true but as i show in that chapter other compounds are generated by the toasting and uh, we don't even know what some of them do we do know what a few of them do and they appear to be beneficial in most cases so anyway whatever uh, so i go into that in chapter four chapter five uh, and that that whole section of the book the middle section is all about pharmacology and all the different effects that chocolate can have in the body and all the research about that 
and the recipe section, the formulary section is in that part of the book. So if you want to recreate traditional chocolate drinks in the most authentic manner that is possible, this book can tell you how. And it's, that's the entire reason for me producing the book, really, for spending 14 years of my life researching it, because I really wanted to be able to do that and to uh, share that knowledge, because every other book on the history of chocolate that I've read uh, tells you about all these ancient drinks. They go, oh, the Mexican and the Aztecs had all these mainly amazing different formulas and drinks of chocolate, and they used to drink them a lot, and they were a bit different from modern chocolate. And then that's it. And there's there's no recipes, there's no, uh, you know, there's a description of roughly how they were made. You roast the beans and then you add these other ingredients, then you froth it up. And I'm like, well, so hence the whole book, really, because that is um, four fifths of the history of chocolate in human history. In other words, you know, the, 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 all the pre-Columbian history up until 1525, there was 2000 years of history of use of cacao bean before then. So that's what this book is focusing on. And then the third section of the book is about the mythological stuff. So if you want me to um, read from any of those sections of the book, or if you've got any questions, then please ask them. Some new people have commented, new comments while I've been yattering on. Um, is it okay to use for someone who's a new mum? Ah, that's a good question. Absolutely. Chocolate was, um, again, I go into this in the book, um, and I may be able to find a little reading on it. In fact, I might go to chapter three, which is the um, bit about traditional medicinal uses, because it was used particularly as a galactagogue, meaning to induce lactation. And there's mixed evidence as to whether or not it does that but uh let's have a look see if i can find the bit in fact i might just use the index that would be good wouldn't it um let's see if we can find it that's the problem with spending a third of your life writing a massive book actually finding stuff in it is quite difficult uh galactagog 139 to 140. I'm sure there's earlier than that, 100. Okay. No, it's... I'm sure there's a bit earlier in this. In answer to your question, Jenny, yes, it's fine. Um, my one caution would be um, for pregnant, well, for pregnant women, it's a, it's an interesting one because I go into in chapter four, no, I think it's in chapter five about, anyway, in the middle, middle section about how there's research on um, some really interesting research coming from Italy. And this research was not fun. Some of the research is funded by chocolate companies. So you've got to be a little bit questioning, but most of the research is not. And this uh, research was uh, funded by the University of Geneva and independent of any chocolate company stuff. So, you know, it's kosher basically. And they found that, um, that it was research done in new mums in Italy. Uh, and let me see if I can find it basically, because it'd be really nice to read, read about it. Uh, but this research found that new mums who drank chocolate during their pregnancy, uh, rated their newborn babies as happier <laughs> um, and this was consistent uh, and even the stressed mums the mums who rate were highly stressed uh, also rated their babies at three months as being happier than the mums who didn't drink chocolate during a pregnancy and there are some several questions that come from that i mean is this because they're all high on chocolate yeah i mean you know high but is this because they've all been drinking chocolate all the time is it because there's a temperamental difference between the kind of people who drink chocolate and those who don't so they might be more inclined to be optimistic about their baby's temperament but that would contradict with the earlier research that finds that people who are really drawn to chocolate are higher in neuroticism in other words, people who are really into chocolate statistically tend to be 
uh, higher in neuro neuroticism, in other words, have a higher sensitivity to negative emotion. So it doesn't really fit. It suggests that maybe drinking chocolate during pregnancy even had an effect on the mood or disposition of the unborn child, possibly. And again, in chapter five in the book, I go into the new neurobiology of chocolate and how it can interact with various chemical control systems in the brain on a very background, subtle level. Uh, like a lot of substances that, you know, including foods and whatever that we're eating all the time, everything we're ingesting is interacting with us all the time on the level that we're not aware of. Like Alan Watts said, the fish doesn't know water. And it's only when you, you know, you dig into this stuff and start sort of pulling all the threads out the carpet that you can see we're being interacted with constantly. We're in a constant conversation with everything that we're consuming it's not a one-way street so one of the sort of ideas that i've sort of stealthily introduced in this book it's not a new idea it's not unique to me but it's a theme that i wanted to bring up is is this sort of idea that when we're consuming plants or indeed anything we are being influenced by that thing so the idea that we are humans are sort of agriculturally so for i mean there's it's a little thought exercise and it's kind of partly a joke but it's also partly not because the idea that for example we're growing wheat and uh we have dominated and genetically engineered wheat to uh you know be our be our own product so so we are the masters of it well from the plant's point of view that plant is now grown on every freaking continent all over the world and we know from the pharmacology of wheat that it contains exorphins i described this in the book substances which bind to opiate receptors in the human brain and give you a feeling of comfort when you eat bread or biscuits or whatever so that of course can be described as as an accident of nature or a reason why we might be drawn to it but the point is from the plant's point of view the plant has an evolutionary advantage to be gained in being consumed by a dominant species a highly aggressive territorial species like homo sapiens so it's kind of like who is cultivating whom and you might think it's a sort of uh it's inserting from a, from a conventional standpoint, it's inserting what's called teleology into nature, which is scientifically abominable. That teleology means you're assuming that nature has purposes, which is um, really against the grain if you are a materialist, if you believe that, you know, if you're essentially a part of the sort of modern uh, academic mindset, which is that nature doesn't have a purpose, everything is kind of accidental, and uh, you don't want to ins assume a purpose where none has been proven. But from a traditional point of view, everything has a purpose. And even the language that we use to describe things is, is purposeful. And it's a useful and interesting thought exercise to look at these things uh, in, in, a spirit, in, a, in a traditional sense where they would sort of assign spirits to different um, entities like certain plants even if that's just a metaphor for the um character of that thing uh if you get what i mean big rabbit hole but i i talk about all that in the book in some detail anyway breastfeeding i think we were talking about let me see if i can find it um breastfeeding and chocolate because it was used in uh and still is used in contemporary Mexico as um, cacao and chocolate. Here we go. Okay. Another application of cacao seeds recounted separately by two Guatemalan women, one of whom is a midwife of over 25 years experience, is to encourage lactation in breastfeeding mothers, either taken as drinking chocolate or consumed in the form of an atole made with maize and cacao for at least two months to increase the milk supply. An additional benefit of chocolate here, whether for new mums or not, is for wasting or malnutrition and drinking is seen to protect a woman when the body is wasting it has nothing no food that's a direct quote from senora carl who was a midwife i met in, in guatemala the consumption of cacao as a beverage is reputed to prevent drastic weight loss 
This is a very practical consideration in some parts of Guatemala where inadequate nutrition is a real issue for many people and becomes especially problematic when breastfeeding as malnutrition can stop breast milk production. Because cacao and maize are both dried products, they can be stored for some time and may therefore be available when fresh produce or meat is not. In the uh, So anyway, I, I go on, that, that's the modern day Mexican folk thing. Then I think there's a pharmacological bit on 139 in a late chapter, where is that? Okay, reproductive chocolate. Uh, this is chapter four. Uh, cacao's traditional use as a galactagogue, a drug to increase breast milk production, a common folk medicine use in Central America, as described in chapter three, hasn't yet been scientifically validated. Horsey types report success using an old gypsy remedy, feeding cocoa powder to mares to increase their milk supply after they fold. Administering the alkaloid salsolinol, one of the trace compounds in cacao, which I described earlier in this chapter, to sheep increases levels of the hormone prolactin in the bloodstream, which stimulates lactation when natural endorphin levels are high. So it could be that this substance, salsolinol, is responsible for the galactagogue effect, for the milk inducing effect observed in folk veterinary practice, particularly as the alkaloid accumulates in the brain and has stronger effects on dopamine releasing cells, which control the levels of prolactin at lower doses because the levels of salsolinol and cacao are quite low. Endorphins create feelings of pleasure and comfort and raise pain thresholds when they bind to mu opioid receptors in the brain. So when the sheep is bonding with its lamb, perhaps experiencing some discomfort from suckling, the brain releases more endorphins to increase feelings of contentment and closeness and decrease the significance of the pain. And of course, that happens in, in uh, humans, in any other mammal species. In this environment, the presence of salsolinol will stimulate more milk production, reinforcing the feedback loop between suckling and lactation. This provides a possible mechanism by which cacao may enhance breast milk production in mammals, as cacao also contains other constituents which modify endorphin release, as we will see in the next chapter, where we will examine cacao's traditional reputation as an aphrodisiac and, effects, and its effects on male and female reproductive function. Okay, uh, so that's the pharma pharmacology of it. Um, so there's the happier babies thing for pregnant women, there's the traditional use in lactation, which I've talked about. Um, there's also the only caveat, this is chapter seven, yes, yeah, seven, chapter seven, Chocolate, Love and Bondage, part two. At the end of that chapter, I talk about any problems with chocolate because cacao, even though it's super healthy, it's not good for everyone and everything. Nothing is. There's no such thing as a panacea. Uh, maybe meditation is a panacea. That's probably the closest you're going to get. But in terms of substances, nothing is suitable for everybody. That's why I think Paracelsus said everything is a poison. It's just a matter of dosage. Paraphrasing. Also, it was in German, but whatever. Um, so, yeah. So this bit, I uh, talk about all the different, a list in at the end of chapter seven, all the contraindications or potential problems, I go through all the myths and or basically all the things that chocolate's not supposed to be good for and talk about the evidence for and against and come to some conclusion. So, for example, it's it's toxic to dogs and other animals. Obviously, that's true. Uh, problems for uh, bone density in postmenopausal women, a bit of evidence there that it may not be good for low bone density. Um, it's difficult to say at this point whether we need more studies um, and also um, the, Apart from there only being one small study done on that, uh, we don't know whether that was because of the cacao or because of the sugar, what form of chocolate they were eating. It's typical of a lot of these studies on chocolate that they don't really make a distinction between milk chocolate and white chocolate and dark chocolate, which is a massive, they're totally different. They contain totally different quantities of cacao and sugar and milk. And so I uh, get on a hobby horse a bit about that in the book as well, because it's a huge methodological issue. Anyway, so I go through several different things and included in that is a bit on 
uh, reproductive function in men. And this may be relevant because if she's breastfeeding, if your friend who's breastfeeding uh, uh, a new mum, uh, breastfeeding I presume, uh, and if she has young boys, this may or may not be relevant. If I can find it, I don't know where it is, somewhere here. Bear with me. As I say, if anyone else has any questions, please bung them down and I'll um, try and answer them. Uh, have I missed any? I missed the middle bit. Are, are there recipes? Mandy, yes, sorry. Yeah, loads of recipes. And Julie, I've just seen your question. Thank you. PMS, brilliant. Um, I'll get to those in a minute. We'll finish this one off. Um, Mandy, absolutely. Yeah, the whole of chapter eight is a formulary, a recipe section. So, uh, yeah, the whole point of writing this book was to be able to reconstruct the traditional recipes. So it moves that chapter from uh, contemporary Mexican Mesoamerican chocolate recipes and cacao recipes and to all the way back to my reconstructed uh, pre-Columbian recipes uh, with varying degrees of authenticity. Some of them I've been able to absolutely reproduce the traditional recipes because we have a record. Others I've had to give my best guess uh, and I've stuck to uh, me some traditional processes and ingredients uh, in order to try to make my, my best guess at reproducing those recipes and I've shown my working throughout but yeah chapter eight is a full uh, in the centre of the book, it's it's in the centre for a reason because it was really the reason I made the book is to be able to produce those recipes. So yes, big recipe section, absolutely. Uh, uh, Julie, research on medicinal uses of chocolate for PMS. Um, I don't really go into that, but I do, I do tangentially cover it. Um, I tangentially cover it in the in the sense that. Uh, PMS, women crave chocolate a lot. So I, I discussed that, I think, in chapter um, six. It's the chocolate, love and bondage part two, chapter seven, earlier in that chapter. Um, so, yeah, that I talk about that with regard to the brain chemistry. Um, I, I don't really talk about uh, the um, medicinal. It doesn't really have a, a benefit for uh, gynecological conditions per se. But the reason it's craved in PMS, yes, I talk about that. I mean, I can say that in two words, well, one word, serotonin, probably, because uh, we know, and you can, from that little diagram, from that, um, my little poster I showed you earlier about the interactions of the chemicals. This is a, uh, a table in chapter five um, that I'll pop back on the screen. Um, I'll sh show that table again. Uh, oh, where are we? No, wrong, wrong thing. Don't want that. Uh, I want this, this table here. Let me see if I can show you. You can see here, this dotted lines mean inhibit. Estrogen inhibits, this is a bit of a wonky line, but it goes down to monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme, which uh, that enzyme hits phenethylamine and noradrenaline and 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin. So because estrogen inhibits serotonin, um, when estrogen levels are high, you have higher levels of serotonin in the brain because it stops monoamine oxidase inhibiting serotonin or breaking it down. Um, and uh, during the period when women are in the lack cycle just before they menstruate the levels are dropping so for some women uh, they really notice that they get very dysphoric the mood drops because the levels of serotonin in the brain drop and of course that happens in menopause as well for a lot of women not all but for so many and the reason chocolate is craved then is because the polyphenols in chocolate inhibit monoamine oxidase as do some of the minor constituents like these tetrahydro beta carbolines there's a dotted line there that goes to monoamine oxidase. And in fact, uh, chocolate also contains tryptophan, the amino acid which produces serotonin directly. Not a lot of tryptophan, which is why the box is small, but it will still have some influence. So anyway, uh, that's super geeky, uh, but I do describe that in the book. And uh, that sort of link is, is talked about a bit uh, 
sort of tangentially, but it's talked about in chapter five. And certainly the um, affinity for many women with chocolate is talked about. This was remarked on uh, as early as the um, sort of early post-colonial era where um, I think I can't remember I put the quote in the book I can't remember who it was but one of the early conquistadors one of the early Spanish um, sort of conquerors in Mexico commented on uh, how many ladies of the uh, many Spanish ladies are addicted to the black chocolate and um, I suspect I hypothesize that that is probably because it uh, bolsters the serotonin levels just before the period when they are falling because of the lack of estrogen. Um, so anyway, hopefully that answers your best all. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mendy. Thanks. Uh, is it okay to use something? I've answered that, Jenny. Um, the, the, oh, I was, there was one last thing on, on your um, question, Jenny, which is I've mentioned the positives about new mums, research from Italy saying happier babies, if they drink chocolate during pregnancy, um, it's used traditionally to increase breast milk production, there's no pharma solid direct pharmacological evidence that it does that, but there is that evidence from veterinary medicine and we do have a mechanism by which it might do that because of this constituent cell solenol which can accumulate uh, in the brain which is present in fermented and roasted chocolate and cocoa. Um, but uh, there's one potential negative. Uh, so in terms of my recommendation, I would say to your friend who's breastfeeding uh, or has a new baby, absolutely have the chocolate. It's, it's health benefits far outweigh any small risks, but it's worth being aware of this one. If she has young boys particularly, um, where can I find it? Where is it? Um, Again, problems with writing a massive book is that you have to find it. So, all right, here we go. All right, so this is in chapter seven. Again, the chocolate love and bondage part two. The end of this chapter includes problems with uh, problems with chocolate. Uh, okay, so uh, possible benefits of cacao for erectile dysfunction were discussed in the last chapter. But there may be a hidden dark side to cacao's aphrodisiac mystique. Theobromine has been shown to cause, theobromine is one of the main alkaloids in chocolate that I describe in chapter, chapter four. Uh, theobromine has been shown to cause testicular atrophy in rats, decimating their fertility. And more disturbingly, the same effect was found for cocoa powder as part of their diet. Acrylamide, too, produced during roasting, is a known mutagen or cancer causer, and its accumulation has been linked to testicular damage in rats. It's not known whether cocoa would have the same effect in human males, but it's concerning that cocoa and chocolate consumption in 18 different countries over a 15 year period from 1965 to 1980 was strongly correlated with increased incidence of testicular cancer in men aged 18 to 30, no, in men 18 to 37 years later in 1998 to 2002. This may, may represent a delayed effect of chocolate and cocoa consumption causing testicular DNA damage in male infants and children, perhaps even chocolate eaten or drunk by their mothers while pregnant or breastfeeding, because the effects of many mutagenic substances may only show up as cancer years or decades later after initial exposure. There was a similarly strong correlation between cocoa consumption during this period and next generational male genital birth defects 19 to 38 years later in 1999 to 2003. So it's very possible that cacao may cause DNA damage in male gonads and genitals, which is passed down to the next generation or shows up later in life as cancer. By contrast, this is not simple though, that's not the end of the story. By contrast, some animal research suggests that flavonoid enriched, that's antioxidant enriched cocoa powder, may reduce DNA damage in the testes of adult male rats, which suggests cancer preventive effects. The polyphenols, which I talked about earlier in chapter four, those are the antioxidants in cacao that you found in the brown stuff. In cacao also protect rats against prostate cancer development and reduce the size of the prostate which tends to increase in older animals and is a warning sign for prostate
prostate cancer. But again, human real life data opposes this. There is a positive link between theobromine intake in the diet and prostate cancer in older men. The main source of theobromine is from cacao or chocolate, by the way. So even 11 to 20 milligrams of theobromine per day, the amount in a couple of squares of dark chocolate has been shown to increase risk in a population survey. This suggests that it may be the theobromine content of cacao which is responsible for the observed anti-fertility properties in rats, male rats, not female rats, and the possibility of carcinogenic effects in men, only prostate cancer specifically. And chocolate is the major dietary source of theobromine. Although theobromine can be produced from caffeine in the body, this study showed that of smoking, alcohol and caffeine intake, none was associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. So the issue wasn't coffee or tea or other theobromine sources, it was most likely cocoa or chocolate. Given that the evidence of risks associated with cacao in its most commonly consumed forms, cocoa and chocolate, on male fertility and reproductive can cancers is stronger than the evidence against, it would be wise for pregnant mums, young boys, and men with low sperm counts who are trying for a baby to limit their intake of shop-bought chocolate and especially cocoa. It's very likely that real cacao drinks made from the whole bean or from things like this, the Willie's cacao that I've mentioned that you can get from Waitrose or online, that's just 100%. Um, I talk about in chapter two, the different forms of cacao that you can get. Uh, cocoa powder is very refined. It's still good, but it loses a lot because it's had the fat extruded from it. And when the fat's got rid of, a lot of the uh, compounds are exposed to air. The fat protects a lot of the things in it from oxidation. Uh, so this is a much more higher polyphenol, um, better uh, uh, representative of the effects of whole chocolate. So a whole bean chocolate product is better than dark chocolate in a bar is better than cocoa powder. Uh, so anyway, it's very likely that real cacao drinks made from the whole bean with its much higher polyphenol content may counteract and outweigh any negative effects and the risks shouldn't be overstated in any case. The population studies assessed relative risk, meaning that the real life increase in the number of cases of testicular and prostate cancers which may be attributed to cacao products if the link is confirmed by further research is very small, but it's there and shouldn't be overlooked. And I finish by saying this may provide another retrospective justification for the Mexica prohibition of cacahuatl consumption, that's the drinks made from chocolate, by children and pregnant women, and their assertion that cacao was to be feared. It may be expected that cultures with a 3,000 year intimate relationship with a plant would develop a sense of its true nature, even if its particular dangers and risks were not explicitly stated. Of course, it may yet turn out that the risks to male reproductive health from early or late exposure to cacao are significant, are insignificant, but as the saying goes, better safe than sorry. My suspicion is that any negative health effects of cacao may be completely context dependent speaking of which and then i go on to the next thing which is parkinson's disease i have like four whole pages on that because that's really interesting it really depends whether chocolate i think may be a risk factor for parkinson's or a benefit in parkinson's on the diet and what else is consumed with it because chocolate con contains substances which can protect against parkinson's and also some substances which might cause parkinson's so whether it ends up on either side i think probably depends on on what else is going on in the diet and, and what and so on so anyway long bloody answer jenny but i hope that was interesting um, does anyone else have any questions or comments or have i missed anything has anybody added anything um i don't think so my uh my screen has kind of frozen a bit oh thanks wendy thank you amazing Totally, sign it any time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, any more? Does anyone want me to uh, cover anything else or go over anything else or um, talk about? Like I say, there's the there's a section of the book on mythology. I've read a bit from that, but I can go into that again. Um, there's uh, other bits of the book I can do readings from. I um, don't know if there's anything else to show you, really. What time are we? half a i might make one more traditional chocolate drink and just have another little drink while i'm um, doing this um 
And uh, yeah, if, uh, please put any questions or comments that you might have uh, down there and I will do my best to answer them. I'm doing this. Uh, I missed anything, by the way. I might have done. How <laughs> Dad, all right, how many years will it take to publish volumes? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there will be a, um, uh, a, a second edition, if I'm very lucky, uh, depending on how many people end up buying this one. But um, I am going to, uh, d there will be an audio book version in, depending on how long it takes me to do, I'm going to start recording that next month. So I am going to do an audiobook edition in the future uh, and may hopefully there'll be a, but there definitely is going to be a volume two. Save me 14 years, no. Um, uh, have I missed any other questions? I don't think so. If I just um, back it at the bottom and let me know. Uh, Okay, <laughs> sure, yeah, Shota, totally. Um, brilliant, okay, thank you. Let, right, so this little drink, I'll move that back a little bit so you can see. This is, I'll show you the recipe in a minute, it's a bit overexposed, sorry. That's, uh, this little powder here is a mixture of maize, maize, ground maize, cinnamon, which is not a native Mesoamerican spice. It's one of the few recipes in chapter eight where I've included, it's a contemporary Central American recipe. Um, I've included it because cinnamon is lovely in it. And even though cinnamon is an ingredient that comes from Asia, so it's a post conquest recipe, but the technique and the, and the base of it is, is, is pre-Columbian, even though cinnamon is a post invasion, uh, modern last 400, 500 years or so addition. A mixture of uh, ground maize, cinnamon, and ground potashlate seeds, which are a close relative of cacao, Theob and it's called Theobroma bicolor, is its botanical name, which is also used to make the cacao blanco or white cacao that I mentioned a while ago, which is this phenomenal process where you, you, you bury the potashlate seeds in a pit filled with water for six months. There's a special process that I describe in the book where they're fermented over six months to make this a white seed that's used as a foaming agent uh, in in uh, in traditional drinks in Oaxaca in central Mexico but this is unfermented ground potashle which has it's it's obviously a much lighter color so it just looks like there's a very plain cereally flavor the little uh, these little additions are additions of my own it's just a bit of chili which you might be able to see the bit of red there and then the green is powdered stevia leaf Chile is authentically Central American, stevia leaf is South American, so it's again a bit inauthentic, but uh, stevia leaf sweetens it and chili spices it, and I like it like that. So all I do with this one, and this drink is called pinole. There are uh, several varieties of pinole uh, which are available in Central America now. Some of them are made with potashle, some of them are made with cacao, some of them are made with just maize and cinnamon or even just maize and water it's a common name used for a variety of different drinks but this is the pinole from um uh, san antonio suchitecape which is in um on the west coast of guatemala and it's lovely it's it's, it's a nice uh, it's it's less stimulating than cacao so obviously it's getting later now so i don't want to be having any more chocolate um this time of night so i'll just make this uh the only thing about this is it does splash everywhere but uh whatever it won't really hold a froth this is just to disperse the powder in the water then what i'll do is i'll let it sit for a few minutes so that the maize and whatever absorbs the water and then i'll foam it again and then i'll i'll drink it and i'll make a sort of thin gruel with a nice cereally cinnamony it's really lovely actually it's very comforting and this is a good evening drink or and what they do in guatemala is for breakfast uh, in particularly the poor people there they can't afford they can only afford to have one good meal a day so for breakfast they have a liquid lunch a liquid breakfast and a liquid lunch and a good dinner and for breakfast they have panacito which is this but made with cacao instead of um potashle so it's it's brown 
sounds more like a, a chocolate maize gruel. And then they have this for lunch with, with and that totally makes sense because cacao is more stimulating. Uh, so they have that for breakfast and they have this one for sort of a lunch or sort of dinner. And uh, this is a, a bit less stimulating. And then in the evening, they just have a meal. So it's kind of like a caffeine delivery system in a way <laughs> during the day. So I froth that a little bit. I'll leave that for um, about five, ten minutes and then I'll just give it a little froth again and then I'll drink that. So that's that's going to be my dinner. <laughs> um, I'll show you the recipe in the book in a moment. Um, hey, thanks, Rod. Thank you. Amazing. Appreciate it. Now he wants some chocolate. <laughs> Uh, as I said, if you've got some dark chocolate in, I did share a recipe not from my book, but by Jack Monroe, the peanut butter chocolate, which I'd recommend if you've got some dark chocolate and some peanut butter, that looks really good. Uh, but from the, if you want to recreate some of the basic recipes in the book without going to the trouble of buying, because all of the recipes in my book, in the formulary, are obviously from scratch. It's like if you wanted to produce the traditional stuff, buy the cacao beans and then prepare them. Very labor intensive, but really worth it if you're banging into your chocolate. Um, but uh, if you want to create some of those drinks without going to the trouble of buying the cocoa beans and then uh, toasting them and then shelling them and then grinding them, which is very labor intensive, uh, you can buy the Willie's cacao, which I'm not sponsored by this guy. I just it's a really good product. Um, anyway, so you can buy that and just grate it and mix it with water and that'll do it. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Hi, Robin. Thanks for joining. Brilliant. Um, just uh, anyone who's joined later, by the way, uh, just from, I know I'm repeating myself, folks, but, you know, it's just obviously I've got to do this intermittently because I did say to people join in at any point. Um, this is not the actual book. This is just my manuscript copy that I had spiral bound. So I have something to refer to and read from from this. I'm supposed to have the physical copy now. I don't because of what's going on at the moment. It's been eaten by the post. Uh, my publisher does have it. It's just that I think all the local post offices around here were shut today. I think all the staff have just not come to work. So uh, that gave me a clue as to because I wanted to deliver some medicines for a patient today, send some, and I couldn't because uh, all the post offices are just closed down. They're not supposed to be, but they are. So um, I don't have my physical copy to show you. The real book is hardback and kind of beautiful uh, with uh, some nice color photos in the middle. Um, it will be in print uh, because, again, it's been delayed. The production, the, the large mass production of it has been delayed because of what's going on now. It'll be in print. I spoke to the publisher today in about three weeks time, but you can order it now. Um, and uh, at the top of this thread, there's the link to the publisher's page where you can order it. It's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and whatnot. But I suggest get it from the publisher's page because for anyone who's come to this today, Thank you. By the way, thank you for turning up and, and supporting me and being part of it. It's brilliant. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to get a copy, there's a discount code for 20 percent off, uh, which is at the top of this thread that you can uh, whack in on the publisher's page and it'll give you 20 percent off. It is a pricey book. It's 75 quid. So with the discount, it comes to like 62. But it is mahusiv and it will be a good uh, reference book. And I think for anyone who's been listening to this, it covers a huge variety of topics. It's chocolate and cacao and its ancient history and its pharmacology and its mythology and all of that. But in the process, it touches on many, many, many other other topics. It touches on uh, sort of world history. It touches on the, the sort of culinary history, the development of foods. It touches on um, the development of an evolution of medicine and thought in medicine and philosophies of medicine. It touches on um, sort of uh, our, 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 our philosophy <laughs> in general, in, in a way, our, our view of life and how, how we sort of uh, in, in the last sort of 200 years, we've sort of got a quite uh, anthropos like human centric view of nature. And sometimes the traditional view where nature was viewed as having sort of an intelligence of its own, whether or not that is objectively true, is a useful thing to think with and a useful inversion to work with. So, I mean, this book, 
I, I think I said earlier, it, one of my motivations for writing it, although my principal motivation for writing it was as a herbalist to produce, uh, to reconstruct all the recipes for chocolate and to produce a monograph on chocolate and to discover all about its uses because I'm a massive chocoholic um, and to, to sort of um, counterpoint a, a, a pharmacological narrative that most plants are just an active ingredient with sort of vegetable packaging, which is wildly inaccurate sort of Victorian notion uh, that we've some people still hold on to, you know, which is it's it's clearly inaccurate. There's enough data to suggest that's not the case. Uh, while I wanted to do that, it, it also is just a, a sort of series of Trojan horses built out of chocolate for introducing lots of other ideas. Um, and uh, for any of you um, uh, sort of pharmacological uh, or historical geeks, uh, anthropological geeks as well, there's a big appendix section with monographs on all the herbs, interviews with about seven of the most interesting people I spoke to, like there's a, a contemporary healer, uh, a Mexican shaman, a diviner, this guy called Keith Wilson, who works in, in, in um, Central America, who calls himself a cacao shaman, who does ceremonies with cacao, very interesting character. So there, there are some interesting interviews in there as well. So anyway, that's why it's it's uh, it's not a cheap book um, because it's massive and, and a lot in it, um, and it'll also be beautiful hardback, uh, which I argued very strongly to have silver blocking on the edges and uh, and it's be all bling, uh, which my publisher was very very kind and allowed me to do because so I thought I'd rather it be slightly more expensive and look worth it and be worth it and be a beautiful product than. Uh, just sort of whack out some paperback version and he, he very kindly agreed. Anyway, right, uh, it's me blethering on. So I just wanted to update anyone who's joined later. Uh, I was charged 60 quid. Oh, the maths is just in my head, Billy. Don't, <laughs> I'm doing it on the fly. I said with the discount, it's 20% it's off. So the retail price is 75. So I guesstimated it'd be around 62. So uh 60 quid <laughs> thanks billy um all right um that's good uh okay i think my little i think i'm gonna have is it it's still too hot i'll do that in a minute um any more questions otherwise i guess i'll just i'll do a little show and tell and then we'll have a look at some other bits um This is my own little matate stone grinding table that I use for grinding chocolate. It's a very, it's a very little one. Um, I did try to import a large one when I went. I bought this uh, in a market in Oaxaca when I went to Mexico in 2008 and managed to bring it back in my luggage at the expense only of minor shoulder strain. Uh, but um, it came back intact, and um, so that's called a metate. You could call it uh, 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 a, me um, a metal appeal, and it's solid granite. Uh, and as you can see, it has this. It's cambered so with with this sort of like the, this sort of tripod structure. So you put underneath it, you put the fire, a little some coals underneath it. In this in this climate, you would in Mexico, it's hot enough. If you grind it in the sun, it stays warm. But you want the surface of this to remain blood warm, so that the cocoa butter in the seeds. Uh, remains or, or stays liquid because you toast the seeds then you grind them on this and uh, this needs to be warm so that the fat in the seeds remains liquid so that when you grind it the whole thing becomes liquid so what you do in colder climates or in colder weather is you put some hot coals underneath it or what I do is I put a trivet with some tea lights underneath it I heat it up in the oven first let it cool a bit stick a trivet with some tea lights under it and that that's why it has this uh so it's hollow underneath so you can do that uh there are some traditional ones that just sit on the floor but most of the ones used, used for chocolate have this tripod thing um and this is very ancient this design uh not this one particularly but this design this uh metate design you can see metate is dating back uh a couple of thousand years in, in central america um so it's got this camber on it so uh, the grinding person would sit at this end and uh, you grind uh, to, away from you uh, towards this end and it's so it's sloped away and any chocolate will puddle this end. They use it for all sorts of things, for grinding maize and spices and whatever. 
but for chocolate it's, it's particularly good. It's also very, very, very slightly concave. So again, the chocolate tends to puddle here when you're, when you're, or I should say the cacao liquor or cocoa liquor, which is the technical term for ground roasted uh, cocoa seeds, because it's not chocolate, because chocolate is really a sophisticated Western product. Again, in chapter two of the book uh, called Bodies of Chocolate, uh, I discuss uh, all the different forms that chocolate has been made made into, uh, cacao has been made into over the years. Again, focusing on the pre-Columbian and ancient uses, but um, I talk about you know the, the, all the you know the cocoa butter and the uses of that, and when that's extracted, and cocoa powder and chocolate and the different forms of chocolate, as well as all the traditional forms like the atolles and the different recipes like cacao waffle and cacao. And all that. Anyway, so this is a metate or a metlapil. Um, and then the grinding uh, implement in classic mortar and pestle style is called a mano by the Spanish now. Uh, traditionally, I oh know traditionally this was called a metate, what I'm on about. That is its name. And then the mano, uh, which is obviously a Spanish name, hand, uh, was traditionally called a metlapil by the, by the Mexica. And you can see this is convex to fit into the slight concavity of, uh, of this. Um, it doesn't look concave, but it is ever so slightly. Um, and, and because it's granite, uh, the surface is um, has all these tiny little pores on it, and it's brilliant uh, for grinding. Anyway, that's that. So, ooh, it also weighs a ton. Well, not literally. But I did order a, I did buy a large one from a market in 2011 on my second visit. Uh, un uh, unfortunately, I followed the device that the advice of the guy from UPS, who, who when I went into the post office there, uh, it was a big one, it weighed a lot. Uh, so sending it to the UK in a box packed with foam would have cost cost uh, 400 pounds. If I was to send it in a crate packed in foam in 2011, a wooden crate with a foam mold around it, that would have cost 900 pounds so he said no no it'll be all right with the cheaper option and um unfortunately i believed him and it arrived as a rockery so that was 400 pounds down the drain so I, I thought i'm not going to attempt that again if i get a large one in future when i go back to mexico if i have the money to do that at some point then i'm gonna fork out the money for a crate and a proper foam packing thing um, also, the moral of this story is don't listen to people who work in these places. Just trust your own intuition. <laughs> Maybe that's not the moral of the story, but anyway, it was what I took from it. Right. Um, OK, so any other questions? I'm just going to make my um, pinole and then I'm going to show you the recipe for this from the book. It's not terribly thrilling, but... This doesn't foam, it's just really sort of thin, sort of soup. <laughs> hmm. That is lovely. Right, let me show you the recipe for that. Okay. slightly higher. So panacito and pinole. Uh, these beverages are very common in Guatemala, particularly in the Suchitecapeth region. Various forms of pinole found all over Central America. These are the instant atoles of the region sold as bags of dried powder that may be stored for many months and whisked into hot water to produce a quick meal replacement or accompaniment. Uh, they serve as staple foods. Uh, Panacito and Pinole maker, uh, Senora Lopreto, who gave me the recipes below, said that for herself and her daughter Panacito is their daily breakfast and Pinole is usually drunk at lunchtime. And then, as I say, that's because the Panacito contains cacao and is more stimulating, more caffeine, and the Pinole is light, is less stimulating. So it makes sense uh, pharmacologically that they sort of order it that way. Um, so here we've got how they're made. Uh, dried yellow maize kernels. This is obviously for a huge amount. They uh, they basically have 
uh, they harvest these things themselves, they dry them themselves, and then they take them to a local mill and they grind them. Uh, uh, Senora Lepreto and her daughter, like most people in that part of, of Guatemala, which is a cacao growing region, have their own cacao trees and harvest their own cacao. So even though they're dirt poor, I mean, they live in a a building which for us would be basically a barn it's just naked breeze blocks a dirt floor no windows um you know they they uh they're able to 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 have chocolate which is you know uh, one consolation for a pretty hard life i think so uh yellow maize kernels uh fermented cacao seeds scent dried cinnamon and then water and an optional sweetener. The only thing about contemporary Mexico is they whack in so much sugar now, uh, which obviously I'm not a fan of. Uh, traditionally, that wouldn't have been the case. Um, and then a large camel for toasting the cacao and the corn, uh, a, a grinding machine or an electric uh, a mill for larger quantities, of course, material or a good food, food processor for smaller quantities. And then for making the atole, a flour sifter or fine sieve, which you don't necessarily need. I've not used one for this one. You need a sieve for panacito because cacao has a higher fat content. So if you make the chocolatey one, uh, it will clump a bit. So you need to run that powder through a sieve before you whisk it into hot water. With this one, with pinole, as you've just seen, the potashle seeds um, don't require that. But to be honest, if you're here, you could probably make the panacito, uh, but you probably can't make the pinole because getting hold of the patashle seeds over here without going to Mexico is pretty difficult. Um, anyway, the instructions are you toast the maize on the kamal, um, you keep the heat low and the process slow because you don't want to make popcorn, then you toast the cacao, you shell the beans, uh, you grind them all together with cinnamon uh, and then you get a fine glossy brown powder with a delicious cereal chocolate cinnamon smell uh, which tends to clump a little on storage owing to the natural fat content of the cacao and that is panacito and the pinole is pretty much the same with a slightly different ratio of corn to patashle you see here that there's three pounds of corn to half a pound of patashle i'm doing it in pounds just because it's easier to see the ratio i've got the weights here in grams as well obviously um Whereas with uh, panacito, you've got one pound of corn to, uh, sorry, one pound of cacao to three pounds of uh, maize. So you've got three to one maize to cacao versus three to one half uh, for this one, uh, which is interesting because cacao is far more expensive than patashle. So just because... Um, you, you want you know that that drink is going to be a lot more expensive but um it is what it is uh they, this has a slightly lower potash uh, content anyway i won't bang on about that that's um anyway i'm going to the second one now the pinole and uh this is i still have a bit left i bought it in 2000 and i bought it last year uh, in 2018 i have a little bit left and then i'm gonna to have to wait until i go back to guatemala to Guess the more, whenever that will be. Now we'll see. A uh, new comment. Oh, thank you, Billy. Thank you for coming as well. Brilliant. Appreciate it. But yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Really, really, really. Thank you. Um, oh, we're right at the top, Mandy. Uh, just um, at the t should be at the top of this comment, not in the comments. Uh, above the event, it says the Nocturnal Herbalist is live now, the Secret Life Chocolate Online launch. Uh, the code is CHOC20. I'll just write it as a comment. Uh, so uh, it's pretty simple. Capital letters CHOC20. And that will give you 20% off only on the publisher's website. So, yeah. Just sloshing Pinole all over my laptop. <laughs> Okay, we've got eight minutes left. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, madness. Hopefully, soon over. Any other questions before before we uh, before I sign off? Um, and thank you, everybody who's come this evening. Thank you, all of you, for joining in and for um, watching this. And particularly those of you who commented and participated. Really, 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 thank you. Um, yeah, it means a lot. So, thank you.
Mm, I strolls. I just want to check this. I sort of had an itinerary, but I've abandoned it as usual. Um, <laughs> oh, I forgot. Any, are you guys still here? This poster, this this thing, I've got a copy of it. I'm going to frame this and put this up. Um, uh, brilliant. Thank you, Shota. Thank you for reposting it. Thank you. Um, I forgot to. I don't know. <laughs> You've done it now, so brilliant. I, I, I typed it and then didn't type return anyway, whatever. Excuses, it's the end of the evening, even though I'm highly, highly chocolate fueled by now, so whatever. Um, this poster, I have one extra of these to give away. Uh, so if any of you are interested, I'm going to uh, ask one simple question, and the first person to answer it in the comments. I will send uh, one of these two, not in a frame. I'm just going to send it uh, in a nice sort of protected envelope. They did arrive with a slight, not a crease. It's not creased, but they're slightly bent there. But they arrive like that. You can't see it though. Once it's in the frame, it's fine. Um, if you want a copy of this poster, which is the potential influences of chemicals in chocolate on uh, the three types, the three subsets of love, lust, infatuation, and bonding um a uh, uh, really geeky poster i'm going to frame it and put it up in my bedroom just because i want to but if you want uh, the other copy of this um then i'm going to give you a quick question first person to answer it correctly in the comments i will send it to um if you uh if uh, once you've answered it correctly um i will if you uh send me just message me uh, either via the Nocturnal Herbalist or via me on Facebook. Just message me your, your address and I will send it to you. So the question is, what is the botanical name for Theobroma cacao? <laughs> if anyone wants the other one of these, uh, first person to answer that correctly, uh, I'll send it to you. Oh, I've just said it. <laughs> That's how frightening. I am now. All right, let me ask a different question. What is the... I've just answered my own question, so that's no good. I need to come up with a different question now. No other thing. Maybe something I've talked about this evening. Hmm. I don't want to make it too hard, that's the thing. Mm. Okay, how about this? What uh, part of the world does cacao originate from? First person to answer that um, gets a copy of that poster. <laughs> Oh, who's commented? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Amazing. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm doing my Tai Chi salute there. Thank you. Um, amazing. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and thanks, Lisa. Genius is pushing it, but comment and compliment appreciated. Thank you. Genius is definitely pushing it. Uh, obsessive thinker is more accurate and also stubborn because I've been doing this for a long time. So it kind of helps to be uh, on the same topic for a long time, right? So the quiz, for the, uh, the quiz question again was what part of the world does uh, cacao originate from? And if nobody wants a poster, that's fine, I'll just keep it. <laughs> and also, any more questions that anybody has? Uh, 
two minutes left, and then we're done. Brilliant. Julie, post up. <laughs> so Julie just uh, message me anywhere on this page or anywhere with the address to send it to and I'll send that out to you this week thank you <laughs> I like this poster it's like probably then you know pharma geek so a uh, new comment yeah oh yeah and Julie just pipped you to it Billy yeah 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 Julie just pipped you to it well yeah correct also Show not Colombia, <laughs> although you're not wrong in terms of the ancestral origins of um, of cacao, um, because as Chantal, I don't know if Chantal's still with us, but Chantal Cody told me last week. Um, Chantal used to be uh, the is is the former creative director of Rococo Chocolates and um, uh, keeps up to date with this stuff, and lately more up to date than I am because I've just been focused on getting the book out for the past year rather than and sort of finishing it off rather than adding more research to it. Um, but there's some research coming about in the last year, which suggests that the wild ancestors of cacao, we knew that the wild ancestors originated in South America, like Ecuador and Colombia, and then were brought up to Central America. Although the criollo cultivar, it's called criollo in modern Spanish, that was developed uh, and makes modern chocolate is and and was used and the seeds were developed into all the different beverages and whatever that produced in Central America comes from Central America. But actually, Colombia and Ecuador were the original, um, sort of possibly the original uh, places of development, um, points of origin of, of the cultivars of cacao that um, were to used. So, you may be right there, Shota, but the, the answer in terms of the origin place of cacao as we now know it is Central America. Um, yeah, that's true, Billy. You do have it in the book. <laughs> Shota, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Brilliant. Mandy, again, like I said to Shota, yep, yeah, you, you may well be correct. Um, I do talk about in the book in Chapter 2, the origins of of, um, of the tree that it was probably brought up from it was brought up by from South America and that some genetic uh, studies have found that the ancestors the wild ancestors of cultivated cacao came from South America but the development the agricultural human development first human use has up to this point been thought to be in Central America particularly what's now known as modern day Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico. But um, there is some recent research which suggests it might have even been developed by humans, uh, the seeds uh, in, in South America, which is uh, not what has been thought up until now. So anyway, 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 thank you guys for joining in. I really, really appreciate it. Um, this is now, I guess, officially done. Um, I am going to be, hopefully, if Facebook has done its thing, I it will pr produce the live video that I will then be uploaded to the YouTubes, able to upload in the, to the YouTubes in a couple of weeks. Um, this is going to be um, available on my Nocturnal Herbalist page, hopefully. So um, anyway, thank you all very much for participating and for commenting and for joining in tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you think anyone might be interested in this book, uh, please uh, send them uh, the information and the link, uh, mainly because, I mean, A, it helps me because I put a lot of work into it, but B, it also helps the publishers who have taken a real chance on it because it's a very large um, book and it's, it's uh, you know, a, a super cheap one. It's, 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 a, it's an investment for them as well. And they're a small publishing house, uh, so it would really help. But anyway, thank you very, very much for joining in tonight. I really appreciate um so yeah i'm gonna sign off now thanks guys all right bye okay <laughs>